listening to the bomb hole. Bomb hole podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb hole. You're going to slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On a big, nice burgundy snowboard. Okay, we are back at the bomb hole, which is presented by Pub Beer. Now, the people want to know, Stony Buds, how are you doing today? So good, my dog. Oh, always sounds good. To my left, we have Mike West in the booth. Mike, how are you doing today? I'm chilling. I'm stoked to be here, guys. Thanks. We are happy to have you in the booth. Uh, for those listeners who are unfamiliar with you and everything that you've done, uh, Michael Akira West, a.k.a. Mike West, founded 686, uh, the outerwear brand, which is an amazing story in itself. We're going to get into that. He's Co-founded and owner of several other lifestyle br- businesses, including New Balance, Numeric, Macon, Maddox, Westwell, and NRI Distribution, which is a massive 3PL provider. Mike is an adjunct professor at USC Marshall Business School. A professor, people. This is going to be a business master class. He's an avid surfer, snowboarder, runner, yogi, and explorer. But first things first, I want to get into the backstory of 686 because it's a fascinating story. Let's just dive in with that. The backstory. You know, the thing is, the crazy thing is, uh, I kind of forget what the hell happened yesterday, let alone <laughs> almost 30 years ago, you know. But, uh, you know, everyone has their own story of how it started. And this was not intentional. Like, I'm going to do this. I just fucking left to shred. You know, I left to go snowboarding. And I grew up. I grew up in the South Bay next to LA. It's called Manhattan Beach and Hermosa Beach in Venice, you know? So I was in the skateboarding. That 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 just dominated my life in the eighties here. And when my homie back in the day, a guy named Alex Bacon here, he who started actually a company called Movement Snowboards back in the day with Dan Paterka and all these other guys, um, Matt Donahue, um, he goes, dude, there's this thing called snowboarding here and you can actually slide skateboard on the snow check it you know i'm like what and this is like the mid 80s you know and in addition to that i saw i saw snowboarding in thrasher you know that was my first time seeing snowboarding in a publication was thrasher and i'm like holy shit let, let's go check it out and um that's how it started going like i was into snowboarding back in the day big bear i worked there and uh you know, uh, I just wanted to snowboard and, and uh, you know, when you're young, you feel like you can do anything here or you, because there's no, like, you can't do that. Like, fuck it, I'm going to do this, do it, you know? And I, I I wanted to, just to satisfy me and my crew, you know, because we, we, we you only know what you're into by what you see. And I was into everything that, it's like wide jeans, just cut off, you know, baggy everything. But I wanted to do something that was kind of like, I can go to the mountain, I can go, like, Big Bear, really a mountain, but it's like a hill, right? But I want to go there and want to wear what I wear in the streets and want to go there, do my thing, and then just wear the same thing. And I was going to school back then, um, and uh, they go, you got to do a business plan. I'm like, a business plan? for What's a business plan, you know? And uh, and uh, it just made me kind of think about what to do. And like, I want to I do something, and I have to make a business plan of it. Let, let, let's Let's try it, you know? So, yeah, I want to hear like a little bit more about that because I heard that you eventually went and pitched the business plan and it got some legs behind it, right? Well, yeah, I think the pitch is like, I just had a pitch to my teacher, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, the thing is, is, you know, now when, when people ask me, hey, how do I start a business? What do I do? Like, okay, there's a whole process back then. It's like, dude, I just want to like, I want to like do something I just love and that doesn't change, you know? But it had it goes. He goes. You can actually do something and create a, that you love and create a career out of it, like a career out of doing things you love. You don't have to work and then do something that you love. Wow! And uh, it, it, it the pitch was just basically is it felt good and um, it, it started. I mean, the business plan is 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 and I still have it today. It's crazy here. It's it's this thick thing and um and it makes you put every aspect of what you're going to do. Their core customer, the distribution the product line, the margins. And I'm like, Oh, I'm trying to put this thing down. And this is not like we, we, my computer was just like, it was, it was interesting. And then, uh, you test it. you the pitch is actually the people you, you hang around with. Like, what do you think about this? And you get your homies and that was a pitch. And if they like it, that, that, that was a barometer, right? Well, how old were you at this time? So I started the company when I was 20. Right. And I was, uh, I was going to undergraduate at 
university called USC, and uh, that's that's where I was. I was twenty years old 20 when I first old. started. Yeah, and I isn't there some story about uh, somebody from Wave Rave hearing it and taking on an account? <laughs> so going to undergrad because the thing is, I, I I didn't grow up like like the smart guy or, or the most talented guy or the guy that had money here. I went to junior college and then I, I transferred to USC and I was entered this program called the entrepreneur program. So it's in the business school. It's like, Hey, entrepreneur, what the hell is an entrepreneur? You know, like, let me go check this thing out. So I applied, but basically it's, 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 it's being really in, engulfed in small business and just doing things you love to do. And I got in the program and during that process here, uh, you know, we had speakers that come and they go, here's my story. So a guy named Steve class and, Came by, and, and if you guys know Steve, and, and, and maybe he's legend, Steve, you know, um, he's, uh, he, he goes, here's my story here. Uh, uh, I'm a pro snowboarder. I have all these crazy ideas. I want to create these extreme theme parks, and, but uh, I have this shop called Wave Rave. And that back then, Wave Rave came from a clothing company here, but so he had the rights to do a, a, a shop. And I, and I had this, I already kind of started. I go, here, here's a concept guy, uh, Steve. Um, it's called... Uh, Jib, Jib 686. Ah, okay. I forgot about Jib. <laughs> it, it, I guess we'll talk about that. And here's a catalog. Okay. A catalog. Okay. No, no, no. Wait. He goes, I showed him a product. I'm sorry. I showed him a product here. I didn't even have a catalog. And he goes, Great. Give me a catalog and, and, and I'll make a, I'll, I'll, and a PO and I'll buy it. And he, and that's what he did. And it started from there. Here's my first shop that I sold to. And they're still, they're he leader. He wrote paper right there on the spot. <laughs> he wrote paper for like, I forget what it was, but he made me go get a catalog. Like, okay, I'll, I'll get a catalog and I'll take yeah. it from there. So it was like, oh shit, there's a transaction being made right there. It was know? that push <laughs> to really yeah. get it going. Yeah. Well, let's run it back to the early days being from uh, Manhattan Beach and Hermosa Beach and the progression of, of skateboarding and snowboarding and what it was like in that era. Cause I think that's fascinating. And I was listening to another interview and you talked about how, you know, skateboarding gave you confidence as a kid. And I thought that was really fascinating. Yeah. It's like, uh, I was, you know, it, and I'll tell you this is it's, 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 I'm getting better of it about talking my experiences myself here. Cause I, I don't know, like I love hearing it, but talking to it, it's like kind of listening to yourself on the thing. It's like kind of weird still, but you know, from my perspective here back then is I wasn't that confident. I wasn't gifted. I w you know, and you compare yourself to others like, oh, my God, they're, they're better than us. And, and you feel just like, but skateboarding to me, it was like, it was like, holy shit. I just found like found something that just meant to me so important here. And and and, and you and it just felt so good. So the confidence or of, of, of getting something you really, really enjoy here was overwhelming. And you had your crew and, and, and the crew was feeling the same way. So I learned a lot by just like, I don't want to say not giving a shit of what everyone else think, but it was like, you can do it. And it doesn't matter how you do it and make it your own. And it was like this, like I call it the DIY kind of perspective because, you know, in skateboarding here, you just find out how to make it. You persevere, you go through it. And yes, there's superstars back in the day that I looked up to, but it was kind of like, it was just, it was awesome. You know? Incredible. And, and back in the day, did you run into Tom Sims and he gave you some pointers or something like that? Yeah. Like in, in the skateboarding days too, like, I mean, I'll, I'll, maybe I can talk a little bit about the skateboarding thing yeah, because that. like that and yeah. that kind of transition to snowboarding a little bit. But uh, like I, I grew up in Hermosa and uh, Manhattan Beach and then I, I went to Venice. Right. And we were like, I, I, leaned, I knew back then when you're skateboarding here, you did kind of everything here too, you know, but I was really in this street and um, uh, you know, there's this whole kind of swell going up in like that area here, like street skating in Orange County, Huntington Beach, Venice Beach. You can see the magazines, you know, and superstars coming across. And then where I was in Hermosa Beach, there's a guy named Steve Rocco, who's I don't know if you guys know that, but Steve like changed the entire industry here, and his crew, um, you know, with you know, with Nottis and Gons and that uh, Mike Vallely, all that whole crew, and then Jason Lee. Like, we met Jason Lee at Huntington Beach, and we brought Jason Lee and Templeton to Hermosa Beach and introduced them to that whole thing, and it just kind of went from there. So it, it meant so much to see that thing here, it happening here. So that was, like, the mecca of street skating here was happening in that area, and we were just kind of, like, kids seeing it happen. So that was huge for me. And so going to Venice during the mid-'80s was pretty hard. I don't know if people know like the Venice Pavilion and whatnot too. 
that was where shit was going down, Dogtown, you know, all those crazy things here, which you see across. And that was like street skating it to its core. And the fashion, the people, the, the fucking ghetto-ness, you know, all together here. I learned a lot of that by just kind of being on the side here and then gradually kind of being involved in some way. Um, but on a small level, like I was never, never good enough to kind of be at that level. I was trying to like, emulate a little bit, like I want to be like them. I was a fanboy, but it was awesome. I learned it from there. So that, that was the start of actually the confidence, the culture, the fashion, and then eventually that transfer to snowboarding. That's incredible yeah. to think back on you're in the epicenter of like the the forging of skateboarding yeah, the, the heartbeat pot, you're right? like in the heartbeat of skateboarding i can imagine that the inspiration was huge from seeing all that yeah, yeah absolutely you know but i mean but the thing is you don't know until because you're in it and that is that is this normal like that's what it is and you talk to others like years later like dude that was that was a spot can you believe that that was a spot that this happened that happened i saw it in a magazine i saw it in a video here you were there like I guess, yeah, I guess. And then you know after the fact, right? It makes it real, too. It makes <laughs> it real when you see, you're like, oh, wow, I saw this in a magazine. I walked by it. It's tangible. It's touchable. I saw Mike Vallely. And then how did that evolve into uh, snowboarding? So my, 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 my buddy there, we were skateboarding with our crew. And our crew is awesome because we had, you know, we had some good pro skaters who came out. Dan Paterka, who eventually kind of went to snowboarding. He was a pro for, I think, evil you know he turned from skate, skateboarding pro to snowboarding pro and then jeremy klein you know all these guys but my that that crew were like hey let's go to snowboard and let's go to big bear you know that's where you're gonna go and let's go i'm like okay let's do it and that was like i think it was 85 or 86 we were in there and there was like bear mountain wasn't bear mountain it was kind of a place called gold mine you know and uh i went to well i learned a place called snow forest which is no longer there and then I went to Snow Sun, which was there. And uh, I was like, you know, when you go like, okay, you feel pretty confident. Like, oh, I can do this thing here. The first day I got on and I was so humbled in terms of not skating on the snow, you know. <laughs> and I remember just like going up in the, the kind of bunny hill and, and Snow Summit and just like, I can't kick turn. I can't turn on my snowboard. I can't just lean, you know. And I, you know, you're just humbling and like figuring out. And then I, I just, I remember on the floor like just struggled and then I look up and there's this guy like it's like it's like one of those like scenes that you see you look from the bottom and it goes atop this guy in this bright neon green outfit here it just goes like this and he had a headband on and, and mustache he was lean forward and twist your body okay 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 <laughs> <laughs> and then like and later I goes hey that's Tom Sims and I'm like what and like from skateboarding, like Sims was like Sims and snowboarding. That was a huge intersection with Sims and vision and snowboarding. And like, oh shit, that was Tom Sims, you know? That's Legendary. sick that he would just give you advice like that. What a what a G move. Lean forward, twist the body. Yeah, at yeah, least, you gotta you know, keep that. Gotta keep that in mind at all times when you're snowboarding. A lot of people would just move, walk, look the other way and <laughs> and not do that. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. So what what time frame exactly is this? Like, what are the years that this snowboarding is happening? So I got a job at Big Bear. So, I, well, first of all, I was going to school at undergrad at SC doing my business plan, you know, but just going there at undergrad from 91 to 93. I got a job in Big Bear at Bear Mountain at 91. I was a snowboard instructor here. So, like, they're like, it was like I was, I remember going to, to Big Bear, going, getting taught by a skier here to snowboard instruct, you know, it was really early. And, uh, that was my first thing. Like, I'm going to, I love snowboarding, but I want to, I want to get a job here and like, let's give that a try. And I remember there's a couple of others in there. And I think, um, that were, you know, that, that, that w did the, the, the PSI thing with me. Ryan Immigart was there too, which is pretty funny. Oh, wow. You know, back in the day. Yeah. Him, him and I, uh, we taught for a while and then he obviously progressed to something much better than that. <laughs> um, but uh, it was there. So being a snowboard instructor, I was a weekend warrior. So those, some of those guys, they they lived it. I had to go to school. I was doing everything. I was driving every weekend. And uh, um, so I was there from 91 to 96. And, um, you know, coming from skateboarding, I was just like, I want to do it. And then I learned. And just by, by witnessing that whole thing happening, I don't know if the, the viewers know what happened during that time frame. It was like this evolution of like just park snowboarding here too and the outlaw park with Perillo and whatnot too. Mike Perillo was like, that was, that was right in her face, you know? So, 
there's a couple of videos that were kind of based on there too. And it was cool, like seeing it yourself, you know, um, and then seeing a video on it, like, dude, that's, I know those guys, you know, like those are the guys here and I'm just, I'm just working there, you know? Um, but it was, it was humbling because it was like, it related to me so much where I, I was used to in skateboarding and it was like swelling, like people, like their style, they're like, just like, I don't give a shit. I'm just going to do it, you know? And back then, you know, we weren't like snowboarders were not like, Oh, you know, like, you know, stay over there type of thing, you know? So it was really, really interesting. I think for the listeners and the viewers, what you were painting a picture of is the Outlaw Park was the first mountain to really, like, turn a whole run into a snowboard park, and no one had seen that yet. So I remember when I saw it for the first time, it was just blown away. Absolutely, and, and, and I, there's a couple there. There's a guy named John Rice, if, if you're John Rice. John Rice is a G, okay? He was uh, he runs, I think, Sierra right now, too, and he's, he's, he's doing his awesome. He was, like, a big advocate of that, you know, as long as this guy named Jerry Bland was a president back then, too, but... And Mike Perillo and that whole crew, uh, it was awesome because they were so creative and he's just just making it happen. And and from that posse of like the big red, I'm sure there's lots of videos on this stuff. Um, it was awesome. Like there's some the crew like what I remember. I wasn't part of that. I was kind of like the the guy on the side working here, but I was witnessing it. You know, but but I made so many friends during that process. You know, and gosh, so many people came out. We have Gooch, Rushy, Bobby Meeks. You know, like I worked with Todd Prophet. Uh, Ryan in regard, there's a guy named Derek Swinford. Oh man, um, Jenna Mine when there was there was a lot of yeah things everybody sweat, everybody you know? was there right. But we had our <laughs> thing, and then we hear about you guys happening over here, and uh, it was it was rad. You know, again, one of those things you don't you knew but you didn't know until people start talking about it after the fact. But a lot of progression, you know, happened there. It's really interesting hearing you talk about the early days of skateboarding and where you're at, and then the early days of like snowboarding and i always love thinking back on the contrast of snowboarding versus skiing because i was a a little young at this time but it's crazy to think back like skiing was this like neon like kind of i want to say country club kind of sport and then you have snowboarders are just the punks and they're not well liked and they're not allowed on a lot of hills and it's just a totally different vibe like it's that early big pants people are bonking they're figuring out how to jib, doing little three sixties on side hits. It's just legendary time. Legendary time frame. Yeah, it, I think we we just we kind of liked it. You know what I'm saying? We we ate it up. You know, just because that's like it, we we were had our place. You know, and there's one guy actually I worked with, named Marco Henriksen. You know, um, Dusty's dad too. He was my, oh Marco, yeah. oh, dude. Marco. Let's give him a big old air hammer. He's a legend. Man, Marco, Love Marco Marco was a huge influence to me. He was just, uh, I haven't seen him for a while, but he was the same dude. He was like fuck let's just go he was like you know he, he was awesome you know and, and those guys just like send it so um personality is galore you know what i'm saying and our snowboard crew or click was so so tight you know and it was rad you were driving up every weekend too huh? dude i was one of those guys yeah, yeah. <laughs> that must have been I, intense i was I, it's the crazy thing is i was rushing a fraternity there too so i was like i was going up on the weekends coming back Sunday and then going to the fraternity, getting hazed to the fraternity, telling that, you know, you're fucking late, you know, you got to get back to me, give me 20 push-ups, you know, and, and drink out of the bowl of forgiveness. And then I was so, so beat. And then you go the next day to school and whatnot too. So it was, it was fun. Good so time. you've just been busy like this your whole life, huh? <laughs> just stacked with all sorts of things going on. I do it to myself. Yeah. <laughs> so earlier you mentioned uh, 686 jib, and I think it's good to switch gears back into that. Now, how did you come up with the name? What does the name mean? Well, so let me give a backstory, right? Jib, right? Um, and, and obviously what you knew was like, whatever you thought was cool is, is cool. Maybe it's not cool, but I was in it. I was like in skateboarding. I was all into curbs and walls and big bear snowboarding. I was all in like hitting things, right? When I snowboard back then I, and we just called it jib bonking. Right. Um, and there's this, uh, there's a store next to where I live called ET Surf and Dave Downing, um, actually big ups to Dave was going, why don't you just call it jib? Um, I'm like, cool. And so I go, let's, let's call it jib and let's call it six. I want to do six, eight, six was meaningful to me because there's some dates in, in, in what six and eight and six mean. Um, it's six plus eight is 20 when I started the business and June of 86 was a time that something happened to my, my grandmother that was special to me. We, we, for the longest time, we didn't tell people what it was, you know, and people had some crazy 
crazy ideas what what we're about, which is funny in itself, you know. But that's how it started. Like it was jib, jibonking, and then six eight six is just we're doing mathematics and just personal stuff. Yeah, I remember that for forever. You wouldn't tell. It was like <laughs> nobody knew what it meant. That's cool. And at what point did you put uh, E Stone, aka Stony Buds, on the team? <laughs> because he was a, he was a rider at one point, right? <laughs> yes. I was lucky yes. enough to be sponsored by Mike. What a cool thing. Yeah, I'm trying to think how that worked. I mean, you yeah, got, I don't even know. It's so so long ago. Maybe Blotto. It was it was Blotto. So we had so many like rad people come through. Our, our thing is, um, I don't know if it was Zacher first. Was Zacher Kevin Zacher was a rep of ours. Um, he lived here, right? Didn't he live there? Yeah. yeah, he lived in Salt Lake for a little while. Yeah, I don't know if it was like Arizona thing, and then Blotto was part of it, and then you guys were all homies, and yeah. and, and Harper and Tanner and all those guys. Like, they had that shop AZP, and they were probably carrying six eight six. There you go. There you go. It's just like it always is, you know. You meet people, and that's how it works, I guess. We had some good, good fun yeah. stories, dude. It's good times. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's run it back to the early the early days of the business. That's I always think that's really fascinating. You you got your first sale with with Wave Rave, and you're going into accounts. And what did the first one to two years of figuring figuring out the business look like? I get this thing a lot in terms of how'd you start, how'd you have the money, how'd you have the resources to start, and what what I did here, which kind of a lot of things happened in the early nineties, and, and even you probably remember this is. There was a thing called the trade shows. So trade shows are actually where you do business. You, you you bring your products. You bring your collection here. Retailers come there and they go, wow, I love your stuff. Let, can I actually write paper? Can I buy it? So back then, and the thing called ASR is Action Sports Retailer in San Diego, which like that was the industry. Like people conglomerate there. Like buyers go there. Video you know premieres happen there too in San Diego. So in the it was ninety. I think it was ninety. 93 because 92 I just started in my like my dorm room here and we had this Japanese distributor and I had a catalog I had to finally find out what a catalog was and it took the photo sh- uh, the, sh- the photo shoot in Big Bear and they go whoa Jib 686 uh, I love it I love it and um, I couldn't even afford to be in, in the trade show that's so I had a hotel side and you know those hotel things you know and they go I want to I want a place to order and it was a hundred thousand dollar US order in 93 going I want to buy your beanies, your hats, your windbreakers here. I had some, I had some, some denim I made, you know, and a hundred thousand dollars. I'm like, did you say a hundred thousand dollars? Like not a hundred thousand yen, you know, and I'll give you 50% now for this. What? You're going to give me a, a, a purchase order. What I, I just found out what that means off my, 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 my Kinko's black and white copy and <laughs> my, my, my couple sample line. I didn't even have a rack. I didn't have hangers here. And you're getting me a check? Okay, I'm down. Okay, let's do it. So what happened was in that whole element, snowboarding, you know, was swelling, right? And a swelling in Japan. The swelling in Japan much more was here. So what was happening is people were like, buy, 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 bring it over there, you know, and it was so popular here. And they were given some crazy kind of payments and terms. And then what happened is from the 90s, there's tons of snowboard companies out there popping up. And when someone gives you money that in your early 20s or teens here, most people just take it. They run. We took the money and we kind of go, let's build a business out of this stuff. And he that wrote was, you a check yeah. for 50K? Yeah. Yeah. Right that, on the spot. Right on the spot. So you could have ran the other direction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they would have never come found you. Like they don't know you. And, and a lot of people did that. So, you know, and, and we were just like, dude, we're going to do this thing. And that's how you, you got money, you know, and, we're and do, do it this right. Thing. Yeah. yeah. And like, and, and then, Throughout the process in the in the nineties is it was swelling and, and and it was so much, but people were like, Yeah, I'm big in Japan, but they weren't big here, right? And I go, Hey you guys, like and I just thought like I'm from here. Snowboarding means so much to me there here. I'm gonna establish my business here. And then what happened is the late nineties, the Japan market bombed and then people went away, right? All right, we're gonna take a quick break and talk to you guys about Sunbum. I rock that mineral stick in the pocket at all times. When snowboarding, you don't want to be looking like a Kenny Rogers chicken out there getting roasted, do you, buds? No, and you don't want to look like Leatherface either. You know, you want to keep well lubed on the sunscreen. You want to stay lubed up. Use you it can, in excess. You can get burned in the winter as well as the summer. So Sunbum's just good people supporting our industry. They do awesome events. They have a killer team. They got Brian Fox. They got uh, Jill Perkins on there. They're doing a lot for the sport. So if you're interested in picking up some Sunbum, what do you do, buds? Well, we got a promo code, excitingly enough. 
You can go to sunbum.com. If your local shop doesn't have it, you're going to get 15% off with the code BOMBHOLE. All right, I have a couple other questions pertaining to this Kinko's catalog that you sold. Like, how many <laughs> how many SKUs did you have? What did you have in that catalog that this guy spent a hundred grand on? Yeah, that's a good question, Chris. <laughs> because, like, how many how many hats and beanies and all that kind of bullshit can you really buy? So, if I recall, okay, because like, you know, you, what you know, we got on brand. I didn't know what on brand meant. You know what I'm saying? So I, I just like, what am I going to do? I had obviously my I think I had two beanies. I had a bucket hat. I had my hoodies, right? I had my tees. I had a snowboard leash, right? Um, I I, uh, I had sweatpants that were eventually going to be the start of our Smarty Pant line here too. I had our first cut and sew, which is a, a, a jean. Um, and I had the coach's jacket. I mean, that was pretty wide back then. That was, that was like, oh, shit, that's a lot of shit, but... Yeah, they they went to town. What was giving you the inspiration to put this line together? Like, how did you know what was going to go in there, how to price it, how to source it? Um, I I guess what was in there is whatever I wore, whatever I used (laughs) back then, and that that's like, oh, that that's me and my homies love that shit, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. So, sourcing and all that process that you know pretty well, (laughs) it's it's another process. Like, a, a guy from USC goes, hey, you know what? You're in the epicenter. Or you know, Southern California area, you're going to, you're in that episode of the garment district. LA is all about that. You can go down the street and you can get anything you need. So I learned it. That's how I friend. Like, I'm going to go get a beanie and put my, get a beanie, that, it's a blank, right? And I'm going to put my logo on it. I've, I got my logo and everything. I went to the library, went through like books to try to figure out and did my research. I found an embroiderer down the street here. And that's, that's why I say, oh, get a beanie, put an embroiderer on, put it, Give it to people in the, the fraternity. Give it to people at the, the, the resort. They like it, go, you know. The cut and sew, as you know, cut and sew meaning custom making items so you get fabrics. That was a different story here, yeah. We, we had to go to, I learned that um, getting denim was, I got denim in, in downtown LA. I got a pattern here. I made it, you know, myself. Um, got fleece from come called Malden Mills back in the day, which is Polar Tech now. Um, it was, we were, we did one of the first what, recycled fleeces there and I made it all, all myself there. You know, you start it yourself and then you find someone to do it and then you eventually kind of take it from there. So you didn't have to go overseas and everything was right at your fingertips in LA. Well, we made it in LA for the first two years and then I went to Mexico cause that was like, Whoa, go to Mexico. They can actually, you don't have to do all yourself, find it over there. And that was, that was terrible because it was difficult to do in a different country. I didn't know. But we were like low tech shit, you know what I'm saying? Low tech kind of stuff you'd wear on the hill, and then we went to like snow stuff or waterproof stuff. Probably two years into it, and that's when I learned right in terms of where to go, what to do. But it's trial and error, right? It's like you learn every aspect of what a pattern or trim, like so how you cut it, and then you figure out how it works, how it fits, and then then. But nowadays you don't have to do that because it's packaged products. You can go put the tech pack and build the materials together here, and you can find people that can actually do it all the way across. So. We learned that the hard way. The hard way, huh? So, yeah. so two years in, or actually, I'm I'm curious about this. So, when you got that check for a hundred grand, and you have to make all that product, and you have to send it to Japan, and you you're doing the cut and zone, you're figuring that. Out. How many people are a part of six eight six Jib? Is it just you, or at this point, do you have anybody else working with you? Uh, good question. You know, uh, we had we had two people, right? Um, eventually, I was on payroll, right, and. Uh, one of them actually is still with me today. You know, Sita, yeah, yep. Sita, shout oh, out wow. Sita. Yeah. Sita's still with you. Yeah, she has like 20 kids, you know, she's awesome. You know? <laughs> um, but yeah, we, but small business, you do it yourself. That was, that's where skateboarding and, and snowboarding and then music taught me to just find it out, hustle, you know? And, and I, when I, when I hear things now, it's like, where do I go? Dude, it's out your freaking figuring trips right now. It, it wasn't before. You got to go and touch and feel things, right? And that's that's schooling itself. So we, we learned it and, and we fucking did it, you know. And now you got the Google, but <laughs> before you couldn't do that, huh? Yeah, yeah. What yeah. do you what do you think about nowadays when I watch all these like I watch like Shark Tank or there's like all these companies that are like people are, are building their brands and they're like, Well, I have this concept for an idea and I'm doing my capital raise and in order to start it, I'm gonna start um and we're trying to raise uh two million dollars just to like before we even make a product. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about that versus, uh, the way you started, you know, to each around what we came and we were talking earlier is like, 
there's this word in business called scaling, right? I didn't know what that meant, you know, like, all right, what, what's, what's the end, end result, guys? How do you scale? How do you make money, you know? Furthest, furthest from my, my mindset, right? We started in 92. We didn't turn a profit till 2000, right? Eight years into it, right? And you were there through like 99. And yeah. I thought it was there. I remember it, and it, it, it was tough, right? So, you know, it, it was a process to kind of figure out what that is. But I just, I just, you know, I learned and I just wanted to do it. And, and, and it felt good, right? And it felt good. And that, that was a guiding light, you know? Now, in, in regards to the space around this time, or uh, late 90s, things like that. So you have, you're forging your, your space in the industry with 686. And what did the other brands in that space look like? Did you guys have your own lane? Well, yeah, that, it was tough because when you have like, I don't know, you have 200, 300 snowboard companies back in the day, and it's like, we, it, it was hard, right? Um, just to go to that trade show, like SIA was the Mecca here, that North Hall, you know, it's like, go there. And that's all the crazy stuff here. Our lane was like, really like, kind of like, you know, born in the streets, born in LA, raised in the mountains here. And we knew kind of what we knew. Um, we didn't we didn't want to be the most technical company. We wanted to just be ourselves. But we had some quote unquote product innovations here that that were inspired from upbringings that are still here today. That was changed our, our way of looking things. Are these things you get patented or? Yeah, yeah. So we have this thing, and what we're, if you ask anyone out there, like, what is six eight six known for in their product? You would say Smarty. Yeah, the Smarty. Smarty. Like, what's Smarty? So the whole concept of that was like. Like growing up in Big Bear, it's it's not that cold, and you want to have style first more than anything's back in the day here. But I took a trip to Banff, Canada, <laughs> Banff, and just imagine going to Banff in the dead of winter here, and everything if you're used to LA, it was fucking cold as hell, right? <laughs> and so I remember getting a shell pant that I just made, and I got a pair of sweatpants that I just I was wearing, you know, and I go. I, I got a layer. I got a layer, you know, I met that together, but how am I going to layer? I'm going to get some, like I got first one was tape. I'm going to put tape around the waist, put it on my, my shell pant and wear it. Okay. And then it, it and then what I'm going to do after that, that's going to keep me warm. And then when I get cool and I take it off, I'm going to take my shell pants off. Okay. And we're just wear my sweatpants and it's, and I can lounge and I can do everything else. Isn't that smart? Hey guys, wanna, I should call it Smarty. Let's call it Smarty Technology, okay? Because it's tech, right? So that was the first step to kind of figure it out because it, I was in there. And then that whole concept of convertible liners here eventually define ourselves to some extent, even to people today, like convertible stuff. What we did differently was instead of going, hey, it's a three in one or it's a convertible liner, I wanted to brand it. I didn't know what that meant, is branding it was something that eventually people can refer to. So when others had a, a jacket, a three-in-one jacket, they go, "Hey, that's a that's a Smarty Columbia jacket. That's this." So the concept was, I wanted to create a branding within something like instead of picking up a cl- tissue, I want to call it Kleenex. Can you give me a Kleenex instead of that? Can you give me a Coke instead of a cola? Can you give me a, a Smarty instead of a, a three-in-one? So that so as people started doing it, as other brands started doing it, you know, the consumer is just like, "I'll just I just want a Smarty." So they referred back to us. So that was kind of the step one hundred and one about kind of creating your own moat around what you do, with star product. You know, do you have a rough F to estimation of how many Smarty Pants you've put out in the past thirty years? Shit, a lot, a lot. Well, the well numbers, a lot. The number's huge. <laughs> it, it, it's crazy because it's one of those things that I don't wear. You know, but everyone's like, it's like it, it works. It, it makes sense, and, and and what we do is layering here, and it's a perceived value, and you lounging here, but. Yeah, it, 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 it's 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 a lot, and no one else right now because we created that. Mo- no one else does it in the entire world, you know. And we have some intellectual property gown and all that stuff. Yeah, I remember you'd get them, and you could take the sweatpants out separately and just wear those. So you did get two in one, and it was a great thing. Didn't you have patents on the tool belt too? Yeah, you know? so we have we have that the tool belt. You're actually. wearing one now. <laughs> These are another inventions here. It's kind of like oh. Man, it's like, I don't, I, I need to adjust my bindings and do all that stuff. I don't want to go down and there's that tool bench, okay? So let's actually have something you can wear. And it's like these these naive, like, things, like, just like, let's just do it. And let's let's create a belt, a tool with belts. So, it, and this is kind of what we did here. This is actually magnetic now, too. And it, it's a, a Phillips, a flathead. You got your, uh, your, uh, 
your 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 bottled up her hair and it just kind of sticks together and you wear it here and it's like always with you. So that was that was one of those quirky concepts that that's kind of still here today. And yeah. it's still here. I, I have amazing. to say, I am a consumer of the six eight six tool belt. <laughs> you are. <sick. laughs> yeah. When, when I was when I was a kid, I remember back at Mount Snow, they had one at the inside the shop, and I wanted it so bad. And I thought it was so cool. I, was, I don't know how I was probably 14, 13 or something like that. And I had it on my snowboard pants. And it was fucking, can see you, mark me down for one sale. <laughs> it sucks using that tool bench like he's talking about. The screwdrivers are attached to it. It's cold. It's a pain in the neck. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. curious about, so is your mind just stuck on innovation? It seems like you're just always uh, thinking about technical innovation with products. Um. Yeah, like so, at, at our company here too. I'm kind of the I'm the creative director here. I'm the one that like look goes, hey guys, this is where we should go. Point at it and let's go there too. Um, I think it's a lot more calculated now. I mean, with data and whatnot too about what how's it going to work, how's it going to work, you know, like what's the margin and whatnot too. But yeah, I just I, I love doing that, and I think that more or less like I'm not out there as much. You know, I don't take those trips and and get on the thing. But so we utilize a lot of our consumers and and team to kind of tell us what's broken. Yeah. Right? So yeah, I'm, I'm very curious when people go, Hey, Mike's a designer. You're like, I'm a curious tinker. I just like to tinker with shit and see if it works. You know, that's cool. Tinker. I'm curious about going back to the, the early days of six, eight, six and the team riders that helped launch it. Like who, who is your squad? Who is, who is the, the team that it was kind of built on the backs of? I, I think there's like, there's generations of that stuff too. You know, um, because we, we didn't have, like, we, our, our whole thing wasn't, like, we had the best team. Like, in, back in the day, it was like, okay, you create rad product, or actually semi-okay product. You have an insane okay. team, <laughs> and you, you advertise in magazines here, and you go to trade shows, and you, and you, and you just collect the money because you, you send the products to the retailer, and they're going to pay you, right? And it's going to snow, right? Um, that was kind of our thing. Like, we didn't really have that. And I don't say we didn't believe it. But we we're like, dude, I can't afford that. And it was kind of like our way of doing things too. So it was it was great. We just we we, we always kind of like product first, but we had some awesome team team guys here. I'm just trying to think of the very early days besides you. I mean, we had Travis Travis was a big part of the early days here, Travis Parker. Yeah, you know? Travis Parker, I was gonna say Parker. Right? Angle Chris Angles, yeah. big E Tree, uh, yeah. E Tree was E Tree. I mean, we had Jesse White back in the day yep. too. Um I mean like God, there's we had, my j- mind goes blank. It, it's crazy the nineties we had we had Luke Winning who was the East Coast. We had like um gosh, uh you know, <laughs> you know who I remember is Charlie Marachi. Charlie, Charlie Marachi. He was a six eight six. He was flying the flag hard when I was a kid. Awesome guys. Yeah, and then then, then you have these next chapters of like Jamie was on our team, Jamie Anderson, Leon Leanne was on our team, um Alexis Wait was on our team. Wow. Um, um, Louis he- heavy squad Louis, right there. Louis was Louis awesome, you know. Um, it, 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 it back back in the nineties, like I knew everything, and like that, you guys stayed at my house. We we came here too, and it, it, it's adjusted, you know. And today we have awesome crew here, but I'm not so like in, involved in that. Yeah, but a lot of great personalities, you know. Yeah, and Mike would snowboard with us, and we'd have meals, and he'd give us tons of gear, and it was just a good sit down and talk about the products. And he actually cared, you know, because he was a snowboarder. And you get with a brand that's not snowboarders, then you don't have that. Yeah. So it was a cool thing. Amazing. And um, now you build all the way up to Forrest. I mean, he's been on for a long time yeah, now. Gee, huh? Forrest, you know, all those guys, you know. McCarthy. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I got a question. This is from none other than Johan. Uh, and uh, I'm, I have to. I actually had to cut it down because it was a minute. It was two minutes long. He rambled. It's like this guy wanted to take the entire podcast for one question. <laughs> two hour. Question. So I had to. I had to take this thing and chop it because he likes to hear the sound of his own voice. <laughs> so here we got a question from Johan. Here we go. Was there a tipping point in when six eight six? And don't take offense to this, but when six eight six went from kind of the uh, fat mall kid brand to the absolute stud of an outdoor brand it is now. There was some turning point where it went from um, whatever it was to now, like as cool if not cooler than Volcom or any of the other gnarly brands out there. Um, it's They've done a phenomenal job. The materials they're using, the fabrics, designs, everything. So was there a tipping point? Oh, that's that's pretty tame. That's it's intelligent code of question there. Yeah. From Johan, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you know, uh, what it was and what it is, right? Um, I, I don't, as much as I would say, hey, yeah, it was all planned, you know, like the, the main thing we can look at is like when we were true to ourselves in the way that, you know, we had, we were doing our thing, we were concentrating on certain things with product, you know, but we had a lot of great people behind us. And that's what I think really changed it is, is you know, um, you know, purpose and people here is really important to me, you know, and some people that really kind of go, Hey, here's the lens where we need to do, you know, and it's not like today let's order, the, let's get the biggest superstar t- team. Let's do tons of marketing here. It's like, let's freaking do it right. Okay. Is you guys are known for what you're known for, but you're lacking this and let's really kind of strengthen that or just maybe voice it out a little more here. So, Brent Sandor, head of marketing here. Pat McCarthy, Sarge, aka the hi- biggest hype guy there is. You know what I'm saying? Those guys adjusted a lot. You know what I'm saying? Because like when you run a quote unquote business here, you kind of have your lane, right? And you know certain things are kind of lacking, or not lacking, it's just not strong at. You know? And I think that we needed to kind of just have that full kind of like balanced thing. And I think those guys really had the long game, and we invested in that, right? And also, too, you got to look at the understanding of the generation back then is to, to scream loud in the 90s and the early 2000s here was different than because you kind of had to do all that stuff here. Now, when we were never about like, hey, guys, look at me over here. Like, let's just do what we do here. And then as things kind of weeded itself out, the, the things that we were doing for a while here kind of like amplified them more like, oh, yeah, they make some nice stuff here, too. Oh, let's let's invest more in that. You know, let's do that. But I'm, I'm, I'm a product person here. And that shit can't fail on you, you know, and that was my lens. And then we had great people to kind of like voice that out, you know? Yeah. So if you have strong product, it's like the foundation and you just have to keep that in mind. huh? Yeah. One thing in my mind that helped do that was the collaborations. And I have a Patreon question as to, uh, that speaks to that a little bit. This is from Steve Janish. 686 has long been known for their strong industry crossing collaborations. Can you speak on what excitement that brought to the design team? using new materials and branded pieces, et cetera? So great question. Um, the thing is, is collaborations are one of those words. It's like kind of like, oh, shit. It's like hype, but it's like, uh, it's so damn diluted, right? Back when I go in the late 90s, I go, hey, because yeah, I'm so inspired from other people doing rad things. And it's not just us. We don't have to hold it. Being from L.A., I was, I was into music and art culture and other brands. So I'm like, guys, like, it would be interesting if we actually did something together and brought your story and our energy together here in a product, okay? And let's collaborate. Oh, shit, okay? And that was the whole kind of impetus of actually starting this thing is cool people doing rad shit, and let's, let's do something together. So I think one of the first ones we did was um, – I knew Shepard back then, Shepard Ferry from Obey. Mm. And we go, let's let's do something here. And then Jack here, I had this idea of like bringing artists together. It's called the Artist Collaboration Effort, ACE. And let's bring that in a, in a product here. And it was like, oh my God, people are like, why would you do that? It's crazy. Like, and then, then and, it, and it, it just popped. And then a company called Dragon, <laughs> um, I go, um, hey, would it be interesting, guys, if we did something here in a, in a goggle integrated in a jacket? You know, like we all wear goggles why don't we actually have it so i I made a built-in goggle pocket that you can see and we let's put your branding actually on our product here and it just went off well first of all people like why would you do that why the hell would you work with another brand that's not yours you know um and it was like it just because we want it the rad people the rad stuff here let's do it and then it just started right and um and it just went off and then eventually like we worked with global iconic brands like another thing that really changed us was we worked with a company called levi's <laughs> so the, back then and this is just maybe understanding your kind of the space where the late it was this was like the late 2000s like people were wearing kind of like if you guys remember that like diamond shit on their jeans like bedazzled oh, shit yeah, on their bedazzled. jeans <laughs> big stitching and i'm like dude this is just uh, i don't get it it's not me i was more that classic guy so what what starts, it, it's a cycle in business and cycle in trends right here. And I go, denim here, the classic denim here is so important here. And who's the, who's the godfather of all denim here? Levi's. So I want to recreate denim and weatherize denim here. And I sent an email to the head of Global Creative, and it doesn't happen anymore. And that just called, she emailed me back. She called me, actually, goes, I, I love your stuff. I actually... My, my husband wears it, and then it just started. So that, that, that helped us define certain moments. And then 
when you do those big quote unquote collaborations back when no one else is really doing it, then other people want to, I want to do that too. And then the, the tricky thing is everyone expects something new and different here. And that's why there's sometimes a point of no return when you keep doing those things, you know, mm. but it's fun. There's, that's, cool. that's an interesting footnote is a lot of the other brands at the time would view collaborations as like com- working with the competitor. And I think that speaks to your character and being like, no, these guys are cool. Let's make something together. And that kind of leads me to a question. This is a broad, since you're a professor, I'm going to hit you with hard hitting questions <laughs> because I'm here to pick your brain. I'm here to learn. I'm, I'm making a master class here, but um, you know, you've had so much success with, with your brands and not just 686, but all your other ones. And I, I'm curious to like, how how important is the importance of relationships in building these brands? Well, you guys know that is so going to school here. There's this thing called networking. I didn't know what that word went. It's a simple word. It's like go there to network, right? What does networking mean? Well, you want to get to know people. Why? You know, because you can you can use them in your Rolodex and. I, it was it was a weird thought of actually getting to know people to utilize for your own benefit, and that was not about. But but I think the point is is you meet authentic people, and that's another overused word here too. But you meet pure rad people here, and that was kind of my whole thing. And um and and it takes you on a different journey, you know, like your journey is different than mine. Could we intersect? And that's where the relationships start. Relationships start with being on the road hauling your sample set around to every single store here and then knowing the buyers, right? Meeting people like Johan, you know, at the trade show and, and all these things about that epicenter of just like energy and community. You know, we call this thing the industry here. Fucking industry is kind of like such a closed-minded perception. It's it's a community, right? And that's how it all started. That's what well, at least we know about it. And, and I, I love that shit, you know? Even though I don't like to be out there, I love that community, you know? It's interesting too because I feel like, you know, as you're saying that, it's like, Every time you meet somebody, it's an opportunity to build a relationship. And if like you're cool and they're cool, then there's like a bridge form there. And inversely, every time that you meet somebody and you're a dick, and then they're like, Let's get, then that, that fucking bridge is burned. Yeah, you just burnt that. Yeah, and it's like this crazy intersection of all these bridges that like lead you to, to uh, go where you end up going. And uh, I don't know. It's kind of a random thought. You got to remember that because you don't want to be burning bridges out there. Now, now I got another uh, hard hitting uh, per- professor question for you too. In that sense, too, what what were some of like the early mistakes you made in starting a brand? Like, what were some some pitfalls? So some of them, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We got we got it's a long podcast. We got a lot of time. Oh, man, it, it's so. I look at this. Okay, mistakes are obviously they they make you better, right? You just got to get over them, right? And um, you know that f word of failure here is only short term, right? But there's a lot of them, right? It's just starting a business here. I didn't have a mentor, you know, that mentor word here to go, hey, guys, this is a good way. Follow me, right? Um, so, you know, in that, you make a lot of mistakes about just how to run a business, how to how to, how to to pay people the overhead, right, about what that happens here. Um, you know, don't do it this way. Go here. Buy it from them here, right? So there's tons of, like, business mistakes about, like, that. If I was going to say, if I was going to start a business, and go, hey guys, there's a there's a business called snowboarding here, and it's actually a seasonal thing here, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it, and it based on you making clothing here, and there's fashion stuff because it's like not just what you, what you keep, it's it's like you got to look pretty fly and just be all that, you know, and you got to create technology. And the cool thing is, you can actually get a PO, you can you can spend all this money about it, and you can actually make it, and then you can ship it to to someone else, right? And they're gonna hopefully pay you because that's gonna happen in snowing here. It's a tough sell, right? I don't want to say that's a mistake, but I would not do that today, right? I would go as close to the consumer as possible. So that was a learning experience because you almost like being in business for 30 years by ourselves, you go almost out of business a few times too, right? So, but that that's that's part of the process, right? Um, tons of those things, right? But it, it, it makes us to what we are today, ideally, right? In those early years, you can go out of business almost every year. Pretty close. <laughs> and, and remember, I mean, partners, right? That's another thing yeah, of having partners, partners right? It's <laughs> a scary thing, too, yeah, if you have to bring them on. And you uh, never had to get outside investing, correct? Well, so to make it start, we we started, and I own 100% of the company right now, but in 2003, I was kind of like, I, I, I had to pay back my parents, right? And that was my parents put everything on the line because I didn't have the money here as you go, you're going to grow. And the cool thing about growing is, 
you have some money, but when you're growing a certain pace here, you need more money to grow, right? So I needed to borrow money from my parents and they just, they, they put their whole house down. And so that looming cloud of like someone that believed in you that didn't have money here, that's giving it, that was like a lot. So in 2003, we go, we're going to go out and find a partner here. So we found a partner that was, um, out and they actually purchased our comp- part of our company. I still owned a part of it here. And they're like, they were actually owned crew and super back in the days too, and split and all these things here. So that was a process going through a transaction. So they bought part of us. We went through them, but we did everything ourselves. It wasn't, they didn't understand our seasonal business here. And then I bought them back in 2008. Right. And so that was my only partner, you know, um, yeah, it was a process, dude. You know, like you've been through that a few must have of been scary then when you had lost a chunk of the company. Yeah. It was, I, so I did not own the majority of it. I owned a minority. I so you were a minority. 25% of it, you know? And they had all the calls then to make. They could do whatever they wanted to. They, they did, but the cool thing is they let us do what they needed to do, you know? Um, and I was still running. We were still doing everything. The only difference is we just were reporting to them, you know? But it's, it's kind of knowing your ideal partner and what their intention is. And, you know, they're great. We learned a lot because they were an offshore company. Too. They're from, they had big businesses, you know, and we, we learned that. So it was, it was awesome. But ever since then, 2008, we're like, 2008, right before the financial crisis, let's just take it back here. And, I, and, I, and we went all in. And then crazy thing is 2008 to 2012 were our best financial years ever. Wow. You know, How then. did you get the, the ability to be able to get the business back? Um, mustering up a lot of money in, in ourselves too. The cool thing is that we, we got some money here too. And, uh, I borrowed some to get it back here and then we got it. And then, then we we're able to pay it all back. Dude, but that's it, incredible. Yeah. It, it's, it's, and it's, and believe me, it's, it's not like I have to own everything here. And, but I just, I wanted to, my whole thing is I want to do things on my terms just because I wanted to, you know, I didn't want to go like, give an excuse. Like, Someone else owns, I can't do this thing. And I want to be freaking straight up to, to the people that help us, you know, like, Dude, you know who you're talking to. This is what it's about. I'm not going to pass the buck to anyone else. Let's let's make it happen. So it was like, I wanted to be very clear with that. That's something that I don't know if all of our listeners totally understand in their space of an independently owned and operated business and snowboarding is actually semi-rare. You know, a lot of the, the bigger companies are owned by uh, parent companies that might be, you know, uh, changing hands every few years. And then they bring in a new set of team managers, a new marketing team, they switch out and everything. You're kind of building, building this entire, you know, career on, on something that could fall out from underneath you. Well, some of them maybe f- they want it to look like they own it, but they actually don't behind the scenes too. And so, that's, that's a scary thing. Yeah. And the, and the, the, the being, owned by a snowboarder it, it's cool because you know like let's say if if you're a, a snowboarder that signs with 686 it's kind of cool to know like all right well I, at least i know there's not gonna be an entire like overhaul in a year or two after my contract's up because there's gonna be all new people that are gonna restructure the whole company and etc you guys seen it on both sides too i'm sure you oh yeah know? and yep so you know like it's like i, I have like you know if anything here like a founder owner operator here it's very rare in what we do but there's a lot of like there's a lot behind that you know pierre being one of them too you know yep you know him an air horn it's huge and and i i connect and i just i love that but it's unfortunately too far between here because it's tough to be that and then do this and i like they just said is i just whether it's an athlete whether it's an employee here i'm fucking responsible at the end of the day you're responsible for your thing like I want you to go, like, dude. There's there's a personality. There's there's someone that gives a shit about you, you know. And let's do this together. It's like a family, you know. what I'm saying, as much as family and business don't want, you do. You have an obligation. You have accountability to do what you need to do. And I didn't want to pass it buck, and I want to create consistency to some extent. Now it ain't easy. <laughs> it ain't fucking easy. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, even Soltech. What you mentioned, Pierre. The, that's 32 and Etnies, and I read for them, and he the literally signs the checks it's like signed but then that's from him it's so it's like it's just so cool to see that and and a lot of brands that appear to be extremely core extreme to be are, are owned by vf corp yeah. or owned by a fucking giant conglomerate which is it's all awesome but it's, snowboarder magazine every year the check was from a different company yeah it would just ex- <laughs> we wouldn't even know that it got bought and sold just be like oh what's who's this <laughs> just every year it was insane so yeah it's important Killer. Now, earlier you were just kind of, you, you said the M word, you mentioned mentor. What's your thoughts on mentorship? Do you have one? Do you use one? Do you recommend one? 
I, I would love to say I have a mentor. I have a lot of other confidants that I actually speak with. And I think part of it is not like I don't want it. I, I have, and I think I said earlier here, it's um, I'm that kind of guy that basically I may seem personable here, but I'm, I'm kind of an introvert. I don't, I don't like, I don't reach out as much, but I, I try to go to, Hey guys, this is how you're doing. And just let it flow too. But I, I have a lot of people I talk to quote unquote in this community here that just, we just talk shit and kind of feel what's up. Um, and I use those as kind of my, my guiding light too. But uh, uh, the recommendation, man, it's like, why not? You know, like you may have the best idea, you know, or what, you know, but share it, you know? And, and I think we were talking earlier, like a guy named Jeff Curl here too, that, that has a long history of things. He told me, he goes like, Mike, you have all these things. Like if you, if you have the opportunity to get to the other side and have all these things here, it's kind of like, you know, why it's, it's, it, I think it said it's like, it's like manure, you know? And if you don't spread it around and, and, and spread that manure around here, it ends up being shit. So you should really share the, the thing about it is whether it's knowledge, you know, resources, funding here too, it's better to do that, to, to do that because it rises all tides, you know? So we try to do that. We try to be very transparent. Like during the, the, the last couple of years, we are super transparent in terms of everything we do. How did we do business? What's not happening here? And it may not be the right thing because you want to put that front on too, but it, I think people appreciate you being very open to a certain step. Yeah. Okay, it's time to take a quick break, talk to you guys about the Icon Pass. Our season of fun is fast approaching, Stony Buds. Yes, it is. From the East Coast to the West Side, across Canada, up European Alps to Japan and beyond, the language barrier has just been broken. To turn up the fun factor, the Icon Pass welcomes three new legendary destinations to its family of mountains. Chamonix in France, Sun Valley, Idaho, and Snow Basin right here in Utah. Starting at only $269 adult, the Icon Pass Session 2-day and the Icon Pass Session 3-day offer a range of affordable entry points. It's time to bring the stoke in and get ready to let the joy out. With an Icon Pass in hand across 50 of the best mountains in the world, head on over to IconPass.com. Okay, we're going to take a quick break and talk to you guys about the style experience, buds. Canada Snowboard is revolutionizing the big air game with their newest event, the Style Experience, with an integrated style contest component that is the perfect combination of progressive and timeless tricks, Chris. Yep, that one is going to keep the revs high, buds. Watch the best snowboarders in the world chuck carcass at the largest big air contest Canada has ever seen in the winter stronghold of Edmonton, Alberta. It's going down in the Commonwealth Stadium, boasting VIP suite options, private bars, heated tents, a vendor village, and more. Fire this one up on the evening of December 10th, Canada. The style experience is made possible through the partnership between Canada Snowboard and Explore Edmonton, presented by Toyota. Get on your most stylish winter gear and secure a spot at the winter event of the year on Ticketmaster. All right, Mike, uh, you started a bunch of different brands here. I'm reading you got New, ba New Balance Numeric, helped launch that in the early days, making Maddox, which I was a big consumer of, Day One Song. I had a bunch of Maddox hoodies when I was a kid. Uh, Westwell and NRI Distribution. Now, I know that, that that's like a huge one for you. Do you want to explain what NRI Distribution is and when it started? So I just want to make it very clear, right? Um, it's 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 not more quality. Quantity is, doesn't matter here. It's not like, hey guys, I I'm this master arbitrator. No, dude, I just I, I was able to be fortunate, uh, really concentrating my core business here. And you run across these personalities and these opportunities, I guess you know. And I was lucky enough to kind of have those intersections meet. Right? It, it it's believe me, it's not the list right here, but. The cool thing about this is running your own business here is you really learn about the things you do well and the things you don't. So you can say the front, the front of a business here is marketing, selling, designing the sexy stuff here. I'm going out, I'm doing that stuff here. The back end, right? Finance, accounting, production, fulfillment, logistics, right? I think in any business here, consumer product business here, you have those two aspects. And we were a customer when we went to Canada in the nineties, we were like, Hey, how do you go to Canada? They speak differently and you know, they, there's different mentalities there. And 
you, you, how do you can't just ship products there? So we found a fulfillment. It's called a third party logistics place. It's 3PL. And we found this company called NRI, which is in Kamloops outside uh, Vancouver and BC here. And what they do is 3PL is you get your product. So if I'm making denim or hats or whatever, I ship it to the 3PL and then they ship it to your consumers. And back then it was retailers, right? So that's what they do. So they warehouse everything. So instead of having your own thing that you can touch, you work with them. We were their customer along with a couple other brands. And 11 years ago, we were at this show called The No Show and we were just drinking and whatnot too. And I, I know the CEO and the founder, he's like, we want to go to U.S. We want to bring our business to U.S. I'm like, well, we know U.S. market really well. We were kind of doing like a seasonal business here. It's only like you're not rolling all the year round. So we were actually shipping some other brands and they're, we're shipping their products. And then we started that business. So there's two founders there and we started it in the U.S. and, and, and it's huge. So we're, we're the largest kind of like, a uh, 3PL fulfillment company in outdoor action, active and fashion products, but it's consumer products. We don't ship refrigerators or mics. We ship things and we do with brands we love. So brands from Stussy, you know, to, to other brands of like Herschel to footwear of native, like those are the brands we relate with here. So we fulfill that it's over a thousand employees we have here and it's all four corners of North America, you know, from Toronto to Montreal to, you know, to, you know, Los Angeles to Pennsylvania, we have warehouses. We do that. So that's the business side of it. So, so essentially to break that down, it would be like, let's say uh, NRI took on the bomb hole. Somebody goes on bombhole.com. They buy a shirt. You would just go to your warehouse. You guys would take the product and then send it to the consumer after we send it to you. More or less. There's a lot of things we work with that. Yeah. But, but that, that's what we work with. We don't, we don't want to try to be the biggest or we need, because we have a lot of small clients too. We have like, the ski realm, we have K2, we have air hole, you know, um, but that's, that's what we do here too. We actually have robotics and all these other things about what works and it's, it's high tech stuff here. It's not just a warehouse with a bunch of people scanning things here. It's, it's quite uniquely different. I'm, I'm just one of the uh, partners here. So I'm not the day to day. There's a whole leadership thing, but it's like those fate of like, you're in your core business. There's something that you care, you work with brands and you have great people running here. And I was fortunate to be part of that. I think the cool thing is like, we want to work with cool people that actually have integrity and, and do s cool stuff here. Um, and that, that's the whole thing. We, we started actually shipping some like other things outside briefly, like, like sex toys, which is pretty interesting, <laughs> dude. That, but it's like, if that's the furthest we go, like, like stuff we are into and then some sex toys, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. A thousand employees. Dude. Oh, over a thousand. Over, over a thousand. Yeah. But again, that, that's, that's the other side. I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. Incredibly interesting stuff. So you're this, this, founder of all these brands and obviously 686 being the one that's the marquee one for you. And I noticed like a lot of other founders are consumer facing pretty heavily, you know, I don't know off the top of my head, maybe Steve Van Doren for Vans. He's always out barbecuing or, you know, whoever, whoever it is, there's the, a lot of, a lot of the brands, especially nowadays are, are the founders are, are heavily consumer facing. You've always remained behind the scenes for the most part. Why did you choose to do that? Um, I, first of all, I think it's important for the consumer and even the retailer to, to know who is behind this or just, I guess there's, there's a person behind what we do. There's a personality, there's a human point of it. I think it's more my, my issue of, of always being the person out there. Like I'm doing this because I fucking love what you guys are doing is doing rat stuff here too. And, 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 you know, there, my name is actually on the product here because I, I, I want to have that story here, but I'm just, I'm, it's just more that thing about like, I don't need to be the person. My social sucks, you know, <laughs> uh, my social thing is, is it's just, um, but uh, I think the cool thing is when you get a, you get a look in your eyes and you look at and, and have that recept, like that connection here, that's important. And, and, and cause I wanted that cause I can never do it. So I'm just trying to figure out that that's what I'm looking for is if I can do that to someone out there, go, wow, I didn't have that. And now I know a little more. I get off on that. Not, not for me to raise any ladder or social ladder. That's not me, dude. But yeah, yeah you know, I, I, yeah, that's cool. It's important. I think, I think like maybe the contrary to that in some senses, when you look at, um, you know, like take a, maybe this is a different concept, but like, like Amazon to me is such a big company that doesn't feel like it has a heartbeat. Right. And so I think it's important to know 
like who the who the person is behind it and the driving and the motivation and the um like you, you buy into who's a part of the brand and the story behind it and and uh, I think that's a really important point that you just brought up just thinking about it as a consumer you know especially when you support smaller brands and you maybe you get a note from the from the owner or something like that I think it's cool to buy into that culture yeah but you know it's it's important like you guys know it, it's all about the crew you have and it really is. It's tough because from the outside looking in, they want to kind of put like, that's the person here too, you know? And, you know, like we don't ever put ourselves above a pedestal. And if we have, and, and in terms of the way that you, I'm sorry, but we, we don't. And I've told everyone, you freaking put your head down, you get your shit done. That's what we do. We keep moving forward. I don't care what it is. When we have these hate mails or these things about you didn't do this stuff, I, I'm, I want to like, please send this to me. I will call the person here and try to work it out. We're no better than anyone else because we're one of the consumers too. We got to be there, dude, and fucking get your hands dirty. So, yeah. Great stuff. Great stuff. Now, I was thinking about this the whole time because early days you talked about making jeans and snowboard, I would say fashion over function gear, kind of, right? Where you just want to look cool. When you're a kid, you just want to look cool and you don't give a shit. And you've transitioned into some like tech daddy stuff. It's like you got your smarty tech, you got your your tool belt, your, your new outerwear is like, it's, it seems like it's like heavily tech driven. Um, yeah. Yeah. Why the, why the switch? Well, uh, there's a few things, right? So, you know, it's evolution. I'm not, we still make, we still make stuff we did 30 years ago, but I think that, you know, I, I, maybe it's age, maybe it's everything else. And maybe it's where we go. Like I'm not just heading to big bird anymore. <laughs> we're, we're, we're touring the world. We're doing things that we didn't know we needed to. Right. And I'm like, we're not about like being the biggest, you know, we're just being trying to be true to ourselves. And I'd rather just focus on something that's really going to accelerate like our value prop. And it is in our, in our whole mission is just to have a better experience outside, you know? And I want to, if I, we can go, we're, we're going up market in every which way in terms of, the, the value in terms of what it is, is I want to make ratchet. You can hold on for a long time. We're not, we're not here to kind of recycle what you have here too. And the cool thing is like, you know, like I, I still see people wearing stuff like 20, 25 years ago here. And I'm like, I get so stoked because like, yeah, it still works for me. You know, it looks actually some of the trends are coming back the same thing, but it, it's kind of like, it's rad. I get stoked on that as much as I get stoked. Someone that just bought it because it, it helped help them. But we're, we make thousand dollar jackets, you know, gore pro jackets, they're shelled, you know, and it, it's rad, you know, because it's like, you guys know, you, you know, you, you, you grew up probably in the park, then you go somewhere else. Like you want shit that works that bottom line, I don't care how much guys, it has to work. And maybe that's our whole strategy is just, just do that versus it's a, it's a business imperative. Right. Definitely. I think there's a, there's an age factor too. Cause I think back in your kid, it's like, just give me some cotton. Yeah. <laughs> give me some baggy <laughs> cotton. You didn't care. <laughs> give me some fatty pants. <laughs> Do I look I just cool? Want to look I, good. Am, am I shivering? Absolutely. But do <laughs> I look great? Yes, I do. I got a quick Patreon question talking about gear here. This is from Jason Zab. I'm about ten thousand dollars deep into <laughs> six eight six gear. Do you guys have product testers? And if so, how do I get in on that? That's rad, dude. Thank yeah, you. Long time customer, right? Thank there. you. You know the <laughs> the cool thing is like we have we have we have. I hate calling them customers, you know what I'm saying? It's not transactional. It's like a fan. It's like, yeah. it's a rad thing here too. And I'm so stoked that they've kind of went through the generations here. Um, hit us up, man. I mean, it's, I don't know if I want to say my email, <laughs> say, but, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I love that stuff, dude. And um, we, we have that. Um, we want to, we want to engage for sure. So whatever we can do for sure. But yeah, you know, like, the thing about us is if you talk to someone in the snow environment, the winter environment, they go, yeah, I probably heard about you guys or one on two, but then you have others like, we're just discovering what you guys do. We have this thing called outerwear, which is snow, snow and ski, you know? And that was an interesting time when we actually opened up to ski, but um, we have everywhere, which is more outdoor to ur like urban street. You know what I'm saying? Those, 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 the, the fans are that they're, they're different, right? They're just discovering us and they're younger, you know? So it's, it's awesome when we have these kind of intersecting kind of people that are into what we do. I didn't realize you had like three pillar categories like that. That's interesting. Yeah. Now, I remember seeing the gear too on that uh, fishing show because the gear was so good. Oh, uh, what was that called? Were they the catch deadliest crabs? catch? Deadliest oh catch. man. They're all rocking six, eight, six gear. <sighs> oh, no way. I remember seeing that on TV and I was like, that's oh, good gear, I guess, keeping these guys warm. You know, the thing about PR, too, when you get that stuff, like, 
we got some nasty PR for that stuff too. It was just because well, there's a relationship, but, but I think Pat, Pat will, McCarthy will tell you, <laughs> you, you get PR there. Some people are like, I just hate that character or that person that oh. does that. We used to like do it. And it was like, but yeah, I mean, because they hate that character. Yeah. It reflects poorly on, on the brand. Yeah. You mean, even all press the guy's is just, good press. The though, guy's just know? trying to stay warm out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, earlier, this is kind of maybe a personal entrepreneurship question, but you mentioned, uh, you, you kind of had like a mantra with the brand, something about a better experience outdoors. Do you guys have like a mission statement? Is there, is there like some stuff like that? That's like driving force behind 686? Uh, you know, the thing is that it's evolved to the extent like you, the mission is kind of like where you are today. And then the vision is kind of like where you want to go. Right. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, the, the simplest thing and, and it's, it's, um, we, we want to, you know, it's, it, how it started here was this more than you expect. That was kind of thing. Like, I want to give you surprises, right? I want to, I want to, I want to give you something here. I want to have a great experience. I want to do what, what more expected. Then it evolved into like these like high tech, good times. That was kind of our motto here to like, you know, like high tech stuff, but, but we want to have you have fun. Then it, then I went to like, you know, like purpose, passion, people here, you know, is this that, but it's evolving you know, but the guiding light is basically is like I said is 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 it's it's better experiences outside. You know, in all ways. You know, we, we do it in a way that's 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 responsible. Sustainability in what we do here is very very important. Our whole thing is it's not just what we make that's sustainable here. It's how long it friggin' lasts. You know, like the best thing, the most sustainable thing you can do here is keep your gear working and not get rid of it you know, or have it come to life in different ways. So we're really into that, you know. You're not trying to make sure the stuff actually falls apart so they have to buy something every year. Yeah. Like people are Land obsolete. Yeah, is that what that's, that's called? what that's called. Yeah. Huh? Your refrigerator only lasts seven years, five to seven, and it's planned. Yeah, you know, that, that's all it's about. You know, we, we, you can't. I mean, there's things out there like yeah. fast fashion, you know, like, dude, we just want to have, like, you know, things that last, like shit just works, you know, and that's and people what, buy more cause they actually still have their other one and they want more. Yeah. You know, but there's, there's hype around that stuff too. You got a new colorways and one or two, but yeah, like it, fashion. It's, it, yeah, but yeah, I, I want to, you know, you know, one thing that was always crazy to me about you is, um, you were running this company. It was going great. You're a college graduate. And then you went back to get your master's while you were still running busy running this company. Was that just cause you just wanted to master business? You just, the pursuit for more and now you're a professor. What is it? What, what, what is it that pushes you? Um, I, I think the easiest thing is I just have a, 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 I'm hungry to learn. Right. And it's, it's not by way, like I need to have these things behind my name or a crazy bio here. It's like, like I just, uh, I had a thirst to learn because, you know, going to community college and going to undergrad here too, like you get steps of learning and interest. Right. And I wanted to get my, my MBA, um, and I got my MBA in 2000 only because I wanted to apply what I learned, like, you know, as, as something that I could actually listen. And, and that was, that was awesome here. And it was, it was, it was, and then teaching was like, it was just more my, my fulfillment. Like I started there and, and it enabled me to do something because I listened. I met some people here, like Steve Classer and this guy named Massimo. <laughs> Massimo was one of our speakers. They went to our thing. And like he started all this stuff here. And it's like, that intersection of just awesomeness was like, I wanted to really sh tell my story. So that was a process for me to go, Hey, Mike, tell your story, tell how it worked. And I'm like me, you know, but you have people, no matter how quote unquote successful or intelligent they are, there's, there's that kind of like, wow, that's interesting. That's the, I want to, I want to try that. So I like sharing that, you know, but, but, but teaching, teaching is a different thing. Like curriculum, you know, all the aspects of what you do as a, as a, as a, as a professor here is quite challenging. I took a break this past year because I need to focus, but yeah, it, it's fulfilling, you know, it's incredible. What is that? I'm, I'm curious too, just to lean into that. What does teaching entail? Well, as a professor, cause I didn't go to college and how much work is it on your end? So I, I, I'm, I'm, I taught with this cool school at USC called the Marshall school of business. Right. So uh, I was able to teach my own class, you know, and they go, Mike, you're coming from a point of view, you have your degrees, but we, and, and we want you to come from the real life perspective, right? Of someone here that has went to school that was inspired by their surroundings and doing something they like to do. So I teach this class called like it's consumer lifestyle products, right? So it's basically consumer products, right? In the lifestyle sector, right? L what lifestyle it means to you. So consu lifestyle, consumer products, 
and I wanted to teach that. So I, I actually, there's a process. It's a 10 class process that you go through to showcase basically from how you start to really where you go. And I have like, guest speakers along and it, it's been really nice to kind of tell their story, but it was intense. Cause it's a lot of work, but the students and they were grad, I taught graduate students MBAs and undergraduates and, and, and they're all different. I just taught this kind of like masters of business of veterans. So people that were in the, the, the military, it's, it's awesome. And have you had uh, people that have been in your classes that have gone on to start businesses and been like, Hey Mike, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's cool because there's a lot of successful people that come out too, but um, I need to check them. And it, 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 there's, you know, when you go to those like, schools like that they there's you see some really like talented people here and they're just like the undergraduates the under, the, the what they just got in there too they have no idea but they're just learning and then the, the graduates there and they're, they're just so accomplished and the mbas are kind of like i just need to do this and, and that and they're trying to climb the corporate ladder but it's it's great okay you know what time it is buds yes name that video part <laughs> All right, uh, Mike, are you familiar with uh, Name That Video Part? I've listened to a few episodes, yes. <laughs> okay, what is your confidence level, zero through ten? So, what's above a zero, right above zero? Just, it's a, <laughs> point zero yeah, one? Yeah. Point zero or, or around there, one. like little underneath <laughs> one, two, because I'm sorry. I, I get set these videos, too, you know, and I'm just, uh, certain videos are mean so much to me, and, and maybe those are in my mind, so we'll see. See what happens. We'll see how he does. Okay, here we go. Well, we sure enjoy having the skaters here. It keeps them off the streets, and they enjoy riding Lance's ramp. And we have them here all the time. Kids from all over the world. Lance, as in Lance Mountain here, right? <laughs> it, it sounds like in the 80s here, too. Um, it's, is it one of the Powell videos, the Powell Peralta videos, right? Yep. So there's two Powell Peralta videos, or maybe three. It was the Buns Brigade show, and then... The Search for Animal Chain and then Future Primitive. So it's probably maybe one of those. It's maybe Future Primitive. You know, there's it. Oh, wow, dude. <laughs> okay. You got it. Oh, wow. Dude, you I got re it. revisited the Search for Animal Chin, uh just when I was working on Mac Dog's episode. Wow. What a, what a movie. Wow. Well, I'll tell you what, what you just won here, Mike. I know 686, you guys make products that are pretty good. Bomb hole, a little bit better. You wow. got some bomb hole merch in here. <laughs> awesome. A little bit better quality, a little bit better tech. <laughs> yeah. You got uh, a bomb hole hat. Uh, some socks. We got a mug, and thanks to our friends over at Yeti, they gave us this nice uh, bomb hole. I think it's called a carry all. Carry all. It's all available at bombhole dot com. Yeah, bombhole dot com. Use promo code uh, Stony Buds for zero percent off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for name that uh, for part two, name that video part. This is for the listeners. You don't have to answer this one, Mike. Uh, you basically comment on the photo of Mike on our Instagram when his episode comes out, and that's where we pick our winner. Here we go. Okay, thank you guys for playing. Name that video part. Uh, yeah, so I have a hard-hitting question going back to your college days. Can you give me the ingredients of the bowl of forgiveness? <laughs> did I say that? You did yes, say that. You did. And I've been, I've been just, it comes back to me and go, what, what was in that bowl of forgiveness? <laughs> that, I don't, you know, that was, that was a question here too, so. In the like back in the nineties, when that there was like no social media, you know, and you can do whatever you want. Like, and and where I went to USC, it's like if you want to have a social life, you got to be in the Greek system here too. But there's a thing called hazing, which is very illegal to do, right? You know, and the being a pledge back in the day, you know, is and for turning here. If you don't don't command, like you don't follow instructions here, they make you do physical stuff. And I remember the bowl of forgiveness was. Anything that you can imagine here that they put in the bowl of forgiveness, like anything, game on, you know, from spit to things like that come out of your body here to stuff that was on the, the kitchen here, they put in that bowl here and you had to do X many push ups and then you had to drink out of the bowl of forgiveness, Ooh. right? So that was, that was, I forgave. Yes. <laughs> that hazing, man. Yeah. Woo. Little scary, sacrament there. Scary times. All right. Well, this happens to be a good time. For another guest question, this is from none other than the one they call Sarge, 
a.k.a. Pat McCarthy. Let's give him a quick air horn first, too, because he's kind of a goat. Okay, here we go. Yo, Bombhole, what's up? This is Patrick McCarthy here. Hype, you got Mike West in the booth. Wanted to call in and ask, uh, how does Mike uh, juggle all the sides of the business uh, while still getting to enjoy the mountains and be a dad and being a professor? Seems like he throws a lot of stuff at himself. So amazing that he's able to accomplish it all with flying colors. But uh, how, you know, what's the best way to uh, understand how you're going to organize your time? So Pat McCarthy, a beauty. Just in all aspects, just just a guiding light, and I love Pat in many different ways. And hopefully, I, I want to tell you, Pat, I love you. And uh, the thing is, it's a uh, it's it's to each your own. It's 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 um I have this thing about like I don't stop, you know. But it's not the answer. It's it's called delegation. That's what it is. <laughs> you delegate basically, and you have great people around you to do what you need to do. But you know the priorities in life here too. My priority, and I, my, my wife goes. You, you care about more your what you do in business than you care about the family. You know, that was my priority because I just had to, right? And then when the family came here, it's like the priorities have to switch. So I'm in that transition here, and you kind of prioritize it. What's more important? If you don't have those things, it, it don't work, you know? The other stuff here is kind of like just certain things I wanted to fulfill, like my box being checked, not, not something I read off and look at me. But it's a struggle, guys. It really is. It's not a balance. And if I can say it is, from the outside, it looks good. It's it's freaking hard, you know. But but I think that things weed itself out. Like if you're not in it, fucking it, it'll it'll weed itself out, you know. And and so I'll try. It's not there yet, but I'm trying. <laughs> so so talking to Pat, he provided a lot of really cool context with this too, because he's like, man, riding with Mike. Like if you're in the snowcat or something like that, you know, you might be taking 15 runs, and in between each runs, he's like locking down major deals. <laughs> quote unquote with Sarge he's like he's on the phone with big wigs I don't remember what he was saying and then he's riding pal like a pig in the mud or something I don't remember what he was the saying sound like things but, he would but say he's that's like, a good impression but he's basically Sarge was like he's like locking major deals in the cat and then he's ripping pal right after so I guess like how is that the balance in particular too with with like having fun still loving snowboarding he sounds like you still get a shitload of days snowboarding and how do you bounce that and still be wheeling and dealing on the phone you know it's it's all about the rad days that's all i care like and and you know when you when you drive up like like driving up there too unfortunately i don't i don't get to do that like my days are like i go with the kids and side slip (laughs) and then i go do some heli stuff that that's my balance here too and um i just get stuck like i get stoked where I'm actually at the resort and I see just people learning and doing the same shit I did. I'm like, dude, they're fucking trying. And you, you give that encouragement, dude. That's what stokes me. And as much as like with your homies on a cat somewhere, dude, it's, 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 it's rad. I love it. Now I have another question too, in terms of, uh, so you guys, I, I just want to ask this and you don't, you can dodge it if you want, but like <laughs> just to get perspective, how much, like what kind of numbers are we talking with 66 like, what's a uh, annual sales can we just just like cause it, i've heard it's like i mean massive. i've heard their top top five as far as snowboarding goes top two maybe even two? for outerwear right are you asked me a question right here what, <laughs> what the? we want to know we want to know about cheddar biscuits we, we need to give us a number like we want to <laughs> know we want to know what, about cheddar biscuits like you just th- throw give us like an idea of how large 686 is before i get into this so, next question whatever large number is or small number here it's not what you do. It's what you, it, there's a guy named Bob Gundrum, right? He says, it's, it, you can't take cool to the bank, you know what I'm saying? And it's what you keep in your pocket. So whatever that number is, and it's in the, is it, is it, well, I'll tell you this. You go through levels in business, right? A couple million dollar business, if I, I hit the couple, I hit five million dollars, I hit 10 million dollars, 20 million dollars. And then you go through these stages, right? We're still going through those other stages, right? And you hit the 50, you hit the hundred, right? So I would say, Maybe we're around there. That that stage is of making the next step here, but it whatever that is, it's what you keep in the pocket and what you invest back into the business. I guess a good media training on dodging that one. Yeah. That was a good. That was a good dodge. But I <laughs> guess yeah, if you're a hundred million dollar company and you're not keeping anything in the coffers, I guess yeah. What is it? You know. What is it? You know. And yeah. So it's it's what 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 you do with the money, right? Amazing. Uh, so in this in this perspective of the fact that you guys are a rather large company there's kind of some interesting bigger issues kind of i think about sometimes too 
if if you're a brand like yourselves, like, uh, is there a question you ask? Like, how do we bring more people into snowboarding? Because the market is kind of small. Like, we think that snowboarding is this big thing, but you know, it's not necessarily. It's not huge. You know, like a lot of the other action sports crush us in in a lot of different aspects and. And just general sport. Think about football compared to snowboarding. We're a little microscopic little thing. So, um, do you ever ask yourself, like, how do we how do we introduce more people into snowboarding? Well, th- there's two sides, right? So, from the business perspective here, um, you know, well, I think I'll let, take a step back here. What we do and why we do it here is more important than how we scale or how big we are. Certain things of what we do here is not meant to be a certain size, right? Those other guys and how it's supposed to be here, it's just not, you know. It, it, and I would, I would, I, I not only tell myself that, I, I tell others, right? You know, growing is great until it's not great, you know. And um, we're not trying to be the biggest at all, you know. We're trying to figure out what we do with it and 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 go in different realms. And and the cool thing is, I guess we're not just in snowboarding anymore, you know. We're in this kind of like sector of like what's swelling in in a non seasonal area, of like outdoor meets the streets and and vice versa here that's that's what gets us excited here and we're not trying to go how do i maximize my my growth in terms of selling to that place or getting that customer here too it's like no we're going to do it by going up market we're not going to go about below you know so i don't know if that answers the question here but but uh, it's it's certain things are not meant to be a certain size and and we know our place i I love love that answer question that has to do with this this is from geoff lynch 686 is a brand that's been around 30 years, but in the last bunch of years, it seems like you guys have made a ton more everyday apparel with a lot of thought into function, performance, and fabrics. Was there a specific event or thought that led into the shift into more of the streetwear? Uh, great question here, too. Um, I would say, you know, there's two sides of it. Like, being a seasonal business that's based upon things that are in winter here, it's challenging no matter what size or what you do here, too. So, but we are always trying to be like how to do it our way here. So, um, you know, I, I, I like to, I'm, I like, I think like to tinker and like to do things, you know? Um, and I understand that there's a, there's an, I hate that word opportunity here is to create some, some elements that you can always have with you. So creating what we've done in snow, this quirky, technical, yet functional way, could we do it in a way in, that you wear in everyday wear here? It's not so like, look at me, like discreet shit, you know what I'm saying? And that's where we saw that there was a the marketplace where I wasn't that active yoga person here. I wasn't the guy that goes in the gym here. I just want to wear some functional shit that actually performs without looking like I need to like do the best, you know? And so we experimented with that and it just went off in terms of what that is. And and that's taken us to different realms. Like our every we call it everywhere. And so many, so many guys, because it's a, it's a guy thing now, it's a younger guy thing here. And they've adopted to like, I can go in the city here and do what I need to do. And then I can actually go take a mountain bike and I actually can go hiking here. I can do things. I had this like note from this like surgeon that was active. He's like, dude, I was like wearing your pants and blood, all this gut spill on it. And it was like, it was great. Cause it just, it just worked. And I put my, my, my scissors in here. I'm like, that's a new experience that I didn't know of, you know? So I get off on that. Wow. Technical streetwear. Yeah. That's cool. Really cool. Um, Try- one last yeah fire it up let's keep the patreon ones I'm dying going to know what this means this is from joseph mccarty can you tell us about kaizen and how you apply it to both business and personal life so i don't know if you guys know what kaizen is I is don't. kaizen is basically this this i guess this japanese philosophy it's not a cult it's not a religion here it's just like a business practice here about slow and steady improvements right here right so it's not over like like I'm, I'm gonna, I'm going here. I'm gonna pop here. It's like this, this mentality is I'm gonna improve every step I do, what I do here slowly over a long period of time, right? And and I just, I just live through that. Like you can just, you can gradually improve by the smallest things, and over time, you know, you have a consistent kind of way of that growth is. It could be personal growth. It could be like business growth. It could just be like how do you guys improve what you just did today better tomorrow and following. So I don't know. I just kind of just live by that right interesting very interesting that brings me back to our patreon interview we did before the actual podcast and uh, one of the questions was what is the best advice ever received we asked you that you had a good answer for that best advice ever received um it's um I, i think for me it's uh 
really truly being yourself and, and honest to what you do and own what you do, you know? Um, you know, I, I learned quickly, like when, when, when I was growing up, it's like, I didn't have an identity. Well, I was too scared to show my own identity. Right. And you, and you kind of emulate, I want to be just like that person. I want to, I want to grow to be that. I want to have that stuff. And, um, throughout life, like following someone else's path, eh? <laughs> ain't the answer. Cause you're always not going to be, you're not gonna be better than that person here. So I've learned it by just kind of like, screw it. You know, I got more confidence because the skateboarding culture here, like, and, and just punk rock, like just do it yourself, make it happen, express what you have. And that, that really grew profoundly. Right. You know, and, and I would say that's the best advice I've ever mm-hmm. received. It's, I love that. I love that so much. It's so interesting too. Cause I think even when I was younger or I look at younger gens and in, in general, like we tend to just imitate people we are around a lot. We tend to be, we tend to just copy people. I tend, you know, but it's, it's crazy that the, our biggest strength is our individuality. When you find yourself, that's actually the one thing that's like irreplaceable is, is individuality and finding that. And uh, yeah. The thing is back then, like when I say back in the day, it wasn't accepted. It wasn't like, dude, I'm just going to be myself. Nah, you're not, you're not part of us. Fuck you. You know what I'm saying? It's like, nah, I actually respect you now because you've stood up to what you're about. It's it's a different time right now. Right. Mm -hmm. Now that brings me to snowboarding, would you consider it a lifestyle or would you consider it a sport? Because that's a, that's a common topic, too, on this show. It's a good question. Have you guys spoke about it? I mean, I don't know, but... <laughs> no, it's a debate. Like, I, I call it a sport a lot of times. I'll be like, because, you know, I have my own take on that. I've said it before, but... And and people will be like, it's not a sport. It's an art. It's a lifestyle. And they get really upset. Where but I'm but, at with it, it's a lifestyle. Yeah, totally. And I think it's both. But I, I it, it's not for us to put our bullshit. It's for you to put say your, <laughs> your piece on it. I, I would say like, and again, I hate looking in the, in the rear view mirror a lot, but that has kind of formed me and for my ideals here too. But like everything I've, I've done here too, from skateboarding to snowboarding too, it was all about how I felt. And I think that's the number one thing in branding here. It's not a logo. It's not a brand. It's how you freaking feel. It's that vibe. And like the lifestyle of how I lived my life, what I bought, who I sit, like what I wanted to be around with who. It was all about that, that, that energy. And that's what snowboarding was about. We, we didn't like from skateboarding, snowboarding, we weren't the popularity. I, when I skateboarded in high school, it was like the lowest of the lowest, you know, (laughs) in skateboarding, you know, but it felt good to me. It was how I lived my life in, in the camaraderie, even though it was small, it was that lifestyle that I was gravitated towards. You know, I don't care about anything else. I don't care about money. I care about living this lifestyle. Right. And I don't want to legitimizing what I did here and my parents going now it's okay was what I, I didn't want. Now, is it totally different today? Absolutely. It is. You know, I, I didn't like in skateboarding. I didn't think about anything else but skateboarding here. R- roller, like scooters, what, you know, like rollerblading, huh? You know, snowboarding, it was kind of like we were, I was, I had my blinders on. Right. But it, 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 it created this culture that, that only what that I felt, you know, now it's an open culture. It's, it's very, which is great, you know, but I didn't want to be legitimized or back then didn't want to be legitimized in terms of what it is in terms of being on a podium, not knocking anyone else that does that, does that, but I was wanted to be the furthest from a sport because it was, it was something that was, I don't want to say it's already, already, already set and legitimized. And I wanted to create our own way of doing things. And maybe that's just maybe a certain way, but I always consider lifestyle. The sport has opened up to new things here too. And there's curriculums for that. There's acceptable ways, but I, I will always feel like that lifestyle is just very different than a sport. It could cohabitate together. Believe me, it, it is. But I think there's a difference, you know, for me. Incredible. Well great, said. great uh, explanation on that. And, and t- so many good points there. And someone's, I think about yeah, lifestyle is, is who you are, is, is your, your life. It's what you do. It's who you identify as. And, and sometimes a sport is just what you do, you know? And I love that was so, so well articulated. And, and from my perspective, when I, when I say like well, snowboarding is a sport, the reason why I say that is because like when it's in the Olympics and you watch Zoe land, uh, a run on our final run and you're up jumping on the edge of your seat because you're shitting yourself like screaming reminds me of watching football or something where I'm like this feel this does feel like a sport to me but I I also like uh, not to not to like you know devalidate what you said because what you said is 
what you br- built your brand on and look at the success of that because it's awesome. All right, we're gonna we're gonna dive back into like personal business masterclass for us because we want to know how to learn run the bomb <laughs> hole a little bit better and stuff too. But I'm curious. All right, we don't know what the fuck we're doing with the show, junk show, like disaster all the time. And do you ever feel like you know what you're doing? Like you got do you ever are you ever like yeah this is okay we got it figured out. Does that ever get to a point? Um, no. <laughs> no, no what, what I'm saying this is it, so like you may say certain things I got this you know but 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 this is my motto like it's the minute you feel like you got it you don't have it mm-hmm. that's that's the bottom line you know and these little kinks or these little things in the road and you guys heard it it makes what you guys are right and I'm sure every someone maybe in the Midwest is going dude I want to be just like these two I got my own thing here too great that's how it starts but Please, man. It's like that's the, these these care that that builds what you are, and you know I don't care if you like it or you don't like it here. If that's what it is, but figuring it out is all relative, guys. Is I could say, yeah, have we figured it out in terms of how to be, you know, a good partner to our our our, our other retailers here? We try to, we strive to, you know, um, but it it there's 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 issues all the way around. But yeah, we'll see. Well, th- I think it's good for a young entrepreneur that's maybe thinking about starting a business. It's like, well, I mean, these guys, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to do. And I love how you said, you I mean, you just, it's like skateboarding. You just DIY, you get in there Perseverance. and you figure it out. And, you, and nobody at some point, at some point with all the success you've had, you didn't know what the hell you were doing. You figured out as you went along. Yeah. It just, when someone goes, you're a leader. You, you're you're successful. Like, what the fuck does that mean? You know what I'm saying? And to whose idea you're seeing it here, you're seeing it there. Like, gosh, like we we as as long as you're okay with it, you know, and you strive for it, and that that's just maybe if I can say it was like, I just I I, I have this kind of it's not, I don't want to say relentless, but like I like persevere. You know, you just keep moving forward here. You know, and I don't want to say what I did or look at me or is we're only as good as kind of the last thing we did sometimes, you know, That's true. And, and in this 30 year, which is awesome. It's a celebration moment too, but let's get on with it guys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> let's yeah. move forward. You know, what's mm-hmm. your long-term goal? Um, so I'll, I'll tell you a few things, right? The long-term is business is part of what I do. Right. But I, I really want, and just like you guys are like, you're, you're creating this kind of like sanctuary or this, this, this the escape for people, right? Like, I listen to you because I love what you guys say. You have so, it, I can tell your, I don't know you guys, you know, but I love you guys. You know, there's a connection point, you know. I think that we're eventually going to, I want to, I want to do this as, as long as I can here, but I, I feel like there's a next chapter in my life that I want to really contribute more to what I've learned and what we are to, to a bigger cause of not, not even snowboarding here, something that's much bigger than what I do, right? And, and I'm looking forward to that, like giving back to the community and not like the monetary, right, but giving every aspect of what I have to some next generation, a new idea. And I'm so stoked about that is, 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 is that next chapter in my life, wherever that is. But right now we're, it's, it's 686 and we're grinding, you know? But maybe take what you've learned through all these years of business and, and being a professor in school and offer something to someone and have them uh, be successful with it too. Yeah, like we have we have Share. new leadership like yeah. that runs a business. I I'm the CEO, creative director, but we have a president, we have head of sales, we have marketing. Those guys have their team, and everyone has that, dude. It's not me, dude. It's it's everyone else. So what what is your? That's an interesting topic too, because as the CEO, creative director, <coughs> how many people are working over there? We have we we were we're small guys, like snowboarding, small and skiing stuff, but we have about about fifty people right now. You know. Um, for us, it's pretty big. We we grew from we kind of double our staff, you know. And it's and we have we do every aspect from design, selling, merchandising, product, shipping. We do all that stuff ourselves, right? We don't sub it. We even we do the photos. We do all that stuff ourselves, right? So what is what is the role of the of the CEO? What is your role there? I, I think there's two things, right? My my role. I, I'm not your traditional CEO because we have a traditional present here that's that's it's that's awesome and new here too so he's the day-to-day in terms of everyone reports to him and then um, i'm mostly product product vision here and my name's on friggin' every check and, and i'm still shackled by the banks because i still <laughs> i still have to borrow money here too but but that's that's my main role and coaching ideally that's one of the things i need to improve here is to coach you know and to go hey guys 
it's okay. It, it, it's it's tough because you know you go through your own things of like gotta get this thing done. I got anything. I gotta cross out the lift, and then then just you forget about everyone else that's just coming up, right? And we need to do a better job of that. And, and that's one of my goals moving forward. Were you the you were the president before, right? I've always been no Doug oh, Doug Doug, Doug Sumi who was oh, so been when with he me. stepped down that's when the new yeah guy we in. had Doug quote unquote retire here yep. and then we we got new leadership and I, I wanted to find someone outside our our business and and Eric Jewell he's our uh, president he came from like he was headed like Levi's men's business so he brought such a wealth of knowledge and he's it's it's brand new so I'm so stoked for that and we have like you have like twenty something year olds not not forty or fifty year olds right the, that they're just have that passion so it's it's a it's a new thing for us like just we have the older kind of and then we have the younger kind of mixing in that's exciting well you breezed over it earlier too and, and you're like it's it's almost uh gonna be 30 years for 686 and uh i know you guys got are bringing back some vintage vintage stuff bringing back some what OG, <laughs> right uh, uh is, aren't you guys don't you have some new some new lines uh that that are re-releases do you want to yeah, talk about yeah thanks chris um we have a few items here we're going to drop um, that uh, it's going to come. I think it's coming or it's coming uh, a few years. We're trying to showcase the different years. So I'll start with um, 93, what our first jacket was. So this is what it, this is a jacket I first made. So this is uh, – it, it, it could actually run today. It's, it's, it's a long fit here. It's pretty wide here. Um, I got this jacket here. I, I got the fabric um, – in Oregon here, and I got the the fleece from Malden Mills here, and I, I made this in LA, you know. So it's actually made in USA here too. Um, so this is what our jacket. Um, I forget what's called here. It's called the. I think, but, it's, I think it's kind of a hitter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's the color here too, and then um, we're gonna re-release this. So there's a kind of a reissue of this thing here. Um, it, it, it will be a little more polished up than this uh, thirty year old jacket here too. We're gonna we're gonna really release this stuff for yeah, a limited release. A thirty year old jacket right there. Yeah, and it, it's it's still it still runs, but it, we had some of the, the team like try this line. Dude, this can still work, you know. It's really simple, you know. So and there's low tech, but it's it's pretty funny here. It's it's rad. That's cool. Yeah. And then there's another one that that we have. There's the name here. It's 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 our it's our it's our first fleece. So we sold this. Nice. Is a, this is a. Almost a thirty-year jack uh, fleece here too. It has all this, uh, and this has the jib name in it too. And this is recycled plastic bottles. Almost thirty years ago, we started here, and it was just kind of like just a hoodie here too. But it had like plaid that I got from LA here, and I made this here. These toggles, which is pretty funny here, that slaps you in the face here. But we we kind of refined it and has the jib, jib six eight six kind of like uh, logos here. So this is another one we're gonna start or uh, pushing out here. Limited releases, okay, is. A jacket here too. Um, this is kind of a. I think this is when you were on. Yeah, too. I this remember is that like, jacket. This is like ni- ninety nine, two thousand here too. It was like this is our tech phase, right? This is like it's going to be like sporty and tech here. So you all these are big, big things here across here, and um, and this actually, if you look inside, which is pretty fun here, um, we've had like quotes in our products here for the longest time here. This is like live for today, you know. But we've had quotes um, in different things throughout the whole kind of history of what we do here. And a lot of details throughout. Um, uh, yeah, fun stuff here too. So we're gonna re-release this stuff. Um, it's gonna look pretty similar to this here. It's a it's a wide short fit, you know. Here, kind of baggy, and this kind of hood here that kind of like zips off. So we're gonna do that um, pretty soon. So it's pretty rad. So the uh, stuff Mike just showed us is actually coming out limited edition in a week. Pretty exciting, but right now, all men's and women's outerwear is live on 686.com. Exciting time. There's all new 686 Gore-Tex Pro Jacket and Bibs, the most advanced Gore-Tex Pro products ever created. They have fused Polartec Alpha Body mapped insulation panels in them. This is the first time ever this has happened. Polartec Alpha was designed by the U.S. military to be ultra-light, ultra-thin, ultra-believable, and quickly trap heat. When you slow down, basically this stuff is tack. And uh, that is why people like me rode 686 and people today ride 686. The stuff's good. Get it on your back. It's live on the site. Let's go. Damn. That was great, dude. <laughs> That's awesome. Give <laughs> him an air horn oh, for that. <laughs> yeah. I get that. I think of flying off the shelf as we speak. All right, Mike. Well, I know you're on the chairman of the board for SIA, the trade show. 
company, basically. What, what's going on with that these days? Um, it's called Snow Sports Industries America, and it actually was based on a trade show, you know, but it's it's changed. We actually sold the show to a company called Emerald that there is a trade show, but we're no longer a part of it. Uh, the whole thing about SIA, and, and Ethan probably remembers that, it was, it was about brands and bringing together. So our whole kind of mission is basically we want brands and, 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 and participants to thrive in this, right, in this, in this winter sports community. Um, so it's not just brands that, that are members here. It's, it's resorts, it's retailers too, and some consumers here. So, you know, it, the whole thing is we're like the association for all snow sports in North America, right? And um, I was just thankful to be on the board. And I'm chairman this past year. And it's it's really getting all the players behind the scenes, right? So we have all the leaders in snowboard and ski here on the board here. But the thing is, it's not about us. It's really about how to better the community of, of, of uplifting it, not based on a trade show, based upon doing good business, right? So we kind of have three pillars. We, it's, it's The first is is uh, uh, consumer. So as much as like trade shows were about retail, consumer is really important here, knowing who you are, right? So when we started, it's like, hey, I'm going to sell my products to a retailer. The retailer's going to sell a consumer. Like, you got to talk directly to who your fan is, Right. So we do like consumer insights. We have a consumer show that's starting in Boston and and this year here. So it's really direct here. It's it's uniquely different here. The next thing is climate here. Climate is a huge aspect of what we do. Everything we do here. So like w- like going getting outside, it's a blessing. Like everything we do that and it, we have to be responsible in how we navigate that as doing business. Are we producing the right product? Are we actually employing the right people? Right? Are we like having the right waste management kind of process, what that means. So climate, cl- climate is a huge part of it, um, you know, and we have Chris Steinkamp heading our kind of area. He was, he, ha- he worked with Powell with, with uh, Jeremy, and he's heading that. And then, um, then we have inclusion. So inclusion meaning, hey, how do we actually really open this up to more than a certain customer, a certain one that is able or privileged to go there, right? Representation matters, right? How you look, you know, where you're from matters, right? Especially with us, like, and I think that we're, we're really trying to focus on what that means, um, you know, in business, on, on hill, outside here. Um, it's a huge aspect. So those three components and with many others and uh, other things, that's what we're about here. And we work with members and all, and all realms to, to, to help better the industry, the community. That's super interesting stuff. Uh, we need very that. commendable. And just particularly on the inclusion side of things, like, what are what are the steps that need to be taken? Do you guys have any ideas? In, in being inclusion, yeah. yeah. So yeah, there, there's a whole thing of of, of cause, like if you're a DEI, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion. Here, it, it's one of the things that just in just in general in business here too. But you know, um, from a business side here too, I'll tell you the things that we've done here because some 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 other brands, you know, um, they're just starting here, right? You only know what you know. For us, we're we're from LA. Like I'm on the border of Compton, you know, and we're in the city, like and snowboarding just in general here, it's, it's a wider demographic than skiing here. Right. We've really made an effort here. Well, actually it's, we've been, we've lived this year and to have, you know, just representation here, but we made a pledge to go, Hey guys, this is, this is where we're about. These are the things that we need to improve on here. And we made a pledge to actually improve those things. Right. But we, we, we have to make sure that what, how we speak and who wears our products here is represented in the best way that is not just who I know and we have to do it. So it's a responsibility. That's, that's more the tactical ways that we've done here too, but it, it's a con- consistent kind of way of messaging too. like, Hey, this matters, right? So if, if you're against what we have here, you have every right to here, but this is who we are. Some, some brands you don't you know, it make cool stuff, but we have values in terms of what we represent. And that's definitely one of them, you know, and, and SI is actually helping others that just may not know so much. Yeah. That's cool. Didn't you used to uh, bring kids from Compton out to the Bear too? Yeah, I mean it's it's like that is fun, and we have actually cool stuff. We do that here, but there's a, there's foundations and associations yeah. that I do like Share Winter. You know, there's a huge organization that does that. SOS. You know, they do great stuff like that. Um, Stoked. You know, yep, Stoked. yeah, Salamis thing. Yeah, that, that's all great. I'd say those are those are short term fixes to some extent because it's consistent. Like this is there's no finish line to go. Hey, I took some inner city kids yeah. to the mountains here and we're all feel good. Nah, that's just that's that's just a process. That's one of the things of many here. Yeah. You know? And so, will they be so able to go back what, up what again? I'm, what I'm wondering is on a bigger on a bigger topic of snowboarding as a whole and lift tickets being well over a hundred dollars, 
where are we at with that? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I would say, so you look at the associations, right? Associations where SI is mainly for branded business here, you know, for brands that do consumer products in the winter sports community. There's other associations like the Outdoor Industries of America that, that focus on the same thing, but the outdoor brands, right? There's resorts. There's a company called National Ski Areas Association, NSAA. They focus on actually how to bring the resorts and how to, how to bring more inclusive there. There's PSI. There's all these things here. So we're all trying to do certain things. We're trying to work together here, right? It's not a perfect science here, um, but the resorts are a huge, huge component of that. Yeah. Do you have any, I mean, I know that's not your area of expertise, but do you have any thoughts on the, the exploding costs of lift tickets and, and what it's doing or good or bad for our industry? It, it's, uh, <laughs> it, so I would look at the two sides here, right? The winter industry and resorts here is, is, is good business right now. They've had some great years here too, you know. There's always a barrier, right? And I, I don't speak on behalf of the resorts, but I know what we're trying to do as an associate. We're trying to talk together and discuss how to, how to better have that relationship between a brand and a resort here, right? Um, and uh, it, it's, it's like when I, I live in L.A., right? So if you go to L.A. and go to Big Bear here, you go to the side of the road here and you see everyone parked. If it's snow, there's everyone parked from the city here, parks on the side of the road, and there's a snow playing. The crazy thing is the biggest snow sports in the, in the entire nation here is tubing. And what, how do you make, there's a point of entry in terms of how to get that tube to how to go on the hill, the money, and then how to take it from there. There's, there's, there's things that people are doing. In LA, it's pretty simple. Like you're, That's your next customer here. And why aren't they able to do that thing? Because of what? It, it's too expensive. I don't have a friend here. It's, it's, it, I don't relate to it too. But, but believe me, when you get that first hit, it, it just goes. No matter how much it costs, no matter what it is, we just need to connect the dots. Mm-hmm. Interesting. We're yeah. lucky to have you uh, keeping your eye on this kind of stuff, man, the big picture. It's yeah. It's it's not. It's rising all tides, guys. It really yeah. is. You know. Yeah, totally. It's like because w- once you get somebody to strap in once, it's like and, and, sold, and you, right? you make it turn. I mean, if you make it through that first day of just punishment, punishment, and you come back for day two or three, yeah, you're you're hooked. But being from the East Coast, it was like such a different deal because we grow up with snow in our backyards, mm-hmm. and then you just go ahead and and we had skateboards, so you naturally go get the Walmart snowboard, and you're snowboarding on the hill in your neighbor's house, and mm-hmm. at the golf course, yep. and and you don't need a lift ticket to go to the golf course and try to do a 180 off of some horrifically built kicker that you shoveled. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, there's, there's bad experience is shitty. Bad equipment, bad bad equipment. That's the judgment. Like when we started, like there's shitty equipment, <laughs> really shitty, <laughs> really shitty, and you guys change it, you know, and, and it's like. That's what we're about. Like, we need to kind of pass it moving forward, guys. Yeah. Yeah, my wife, first time her, she went up snowboarding, it was really cold. She didn't have the right gear and had a bad time. And so she's not a snowboarder. Yeah. So we got to make sure people get up there, have the right good time, and keep them going. Keep them going. Well, another question I have, we're jumping all over the place. So we're, Buds and I, we're, we're not in college attendants, graduates. Attendance. We're not, <laughs> uh, we're not exactly scholars, we'll say, but we've been, we've, we've figured out how to navigate. Street okay. knowledge. We get street knowledge. Yeah, Buds is the code of the streets. Code locked of the streets. In. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, I'm curious on, are you, are you pro college? What's your thoughts on, you know, a lot of parents are saying you need to go to college or a lot of people are anti, what's your take on college? Um, so I'll tell you this. Okay. Uh, I didn't have the means to actually pay for certain things for college here. So I took baby steps. I wasn't ready after high school here. I think the main thing for college was any realistic is the checkbox for your parents. Right. But it was, I think for me, it's a sense of accomplishment, right? Mm. I, I started something and I finished something here. It may not been the right for me. I definitely wasn't the best student here, but it was like, I did something here too. And it brought something, it brought a cool experience. I learned, I fucked up or whatever too, but it was there, right? You guys probably have your own ways. If you've done that too, it was just a means of doing something here. And that's a little degree that you have here, but it did kind of lead me to something else. Cause I was able to meet certain people here, but it wasn't like be the best. It was like, just have the great time. And if your support system would do it, if your means can do it, that's, I a hundred percent support that, you know? Killer. Well, it's a good time for, you know what, buds? It's pub beer time, my friend. It's time to crack some can. <laughs> <laughs> that was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shout out to pub beer. 
<laughs> if you're thinking about having one beer, five beers, 50 beers, 75 beers, responsibly, I should say, for legal purposes, what are you going to choose, buds? I'm going to choose pub beer every time. It's cheap, it's fun, and it's beer. <laughs> Did you- Welcome to the pub beer crap shoot. You're going to roll two dice, my friend, and uh, the Goon Gear logo is a six, and we will tell you what to do. You're going to answer questions. Something on this oh, sheet. Okay. okay, here we, here go. we go. Ten? Four and Goon Gear. We got a ten. All right, I'm just going to change it to eleven because I like this one better. <laughs> if you had to be Siamese twins with one person in the industry, who would you be t- chose to be stuck with? Just stuck with. Yeah, wow. you're, you're, you're like your connected. body parts are connected, <laughs> and you have to be with them at all times. All time, hypothetically. 7. I mean, I don't know how this oh, all gosh. works, but I'm sure doctors can figure it out at this <laughs> point. There's a lot of technology happening. You know, in what I do here, it's all about balance, guys. You know, um, I'm definitely, I'm definitely not the hype guy. <laughs> so, but Pat, Pat McCarthy, you know, Sarge, it's like, dude, it, it, I, I think you, you, you've touched so many different people here in so many different ways, and in, in the most positive ways, you know. Um, I remember when you had lots of hair and it's a little different now too, but, but you know, I, I can bring some of that, you know, and you used to like comb that over and put that out on, but, but you just shave that shit off, you know, but, but we, we will, I, I would love to be stuck with you dude in every which way, but Bethany would not like it, dude. So yes, Mr. Pat McCarthy. Nice. Sarge, good answer. I love that one. It's a great answer. <laughs> well, I think it's a good time for, uh, for hot takes, buds. What do yeah, you think? Yeah, let's do it. We like to ask these every single episode. Um, so, first one we always ask, and it's kind of in your opinion as it pertains to you. It doesn't necessarily have to be statistical. That's how we like to process this. But who is your greatest of all time goat of snowboarding? Uh, or we sometimes even say Michael Jordan of snowboarding, both male and female. So, does this have to be only one or can be through different, different aspects of... It's kind of one. One male, one female. The male... Terry Kidwell. Nice. Ter- wow. We haven't got that one. Slap some respect Love that answer. So, Terry Kidwell. TK, I'll tell you the why here, too. Um, you know, because I saw my first experience in, in a magazine from snowboarding here, in, in Thrasher magazine here, Terry had, Terry just had that style, right? And he had that, like, when you just tweak that method here, it's just like, and, and for me, it's all about style. And ever since Terry led the way, and then obviously, like Jamie and all those ones that brought their own style here and like Noah Slasic and all, like all those guys here, they had their own style. It wasn't the same here. So TK, he brought it to me first. The father sure. of freestyle. That's what they call him too. Oh, yeah. yeah. And for female. So th- there's someone that, that it was really, it's, it's tough because it, it, we probably don't know where is um, Crystal Dana. I don't know if Crystal Dana, there's the back in the Damien Sanders days, you know, mm. D- D- Damien Sanders, like Crystal had that headband. She was really the go to me. She's a dear friend. I haven't talked to her for a little while. She was like, she like, she brought the freestyle element to me. And that eighties moment here was pretty important here. And there's so many others that kind of follow that, but she kind of broke that barrier from like freestyle to, to like style here. So those, and the, maybe that's not the biggest name, but that was really important to me. You know, that's yeah. cool. Who's the most underrated, in your opinion? Underrated in terms of the exposure, in terms of just notoriety, you know? Like, I'm getting a little bi- biased, you know? Like, uh, like someone like Forrest Bailey, like, he, he, like, he has so much talent, you know what I'm saying? Not just on the hill, too. Just He just, he just brings it. And I really respect others that really have a, a skill or they're really into that stuff. So is that underrated? Maybe not. But he should be really a lot more than maybe not. He is. He's already big. But it's I mean, just like, yeah. probably likes I think that's that a good way. answer, yeah. though. No, yeah. he, he though, he's accomplished a lot on his snowboard, too. I think that's a great. I mean, yeah, when an edit from him comes out. Woo. Yeah, he films a whole part. In People the trip. are just blown away. Okay, next tr- uh, question: Rails or powder? Powder, guys. I'm <laughs> sorry. Okay, yeah. best style ever. Jamie. Jamie Lynn. Jamie. Jamie Lynn. Lynn. Okay, just to clarify that. Uh, best video ever made. It, it, it it's pretty typical, but hard, hard, and hungry, and homeless. It was it was the time that I lived through. So shout out to Mac Dog and hard, hungry, and homeless is is so profound on me. And everything I lived through. Great answer. Favorite snowboard graphic ever made? 
Um, oh gosh, you know, I have tons of skateboard graphics, but the snower graphic is, um, uh, <laughs> if you remember the Lamar boards, the Lamar mm-hmm. boards and the, yeah. that, that kind of like Lamar kind of like that kind of yeah, like yeah. that pointy nose. Yeah, it had the unique shape. It was really neat. Like I've just, I'm drawn to shapes like you know, the hammerhead. It's like all like these unique shapes. Like there'll never be one of those again today. Yeah. So yeah. That, that hammerhead was cool. <laughs> What's your skate graphic that stands out to you? Um, a lot of uh, Mark McKee he, graphic he, artist. He's profoundly like the Vallely barn, the pigs in the barn. Mm-hmm. That was, mm-hmm. that was, that one. was, that was insane to me. Yeah. I love that. Cool. Okay. If you go heli boarding with three people, just good times, no cameras. Who are you throwing in the heli? Uh, <sighs> I would say that guy that, that, you know, with the beer and that 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 Johan, he's he's Johan. he's uh, he's really up there. Johan, um, <laughs> I don't know about that choice. So you want him talking call. shit in your in the headphones? Yeah, the he just he, it's it's fun. It's amusing too. True, um, Devin, I would love to go up with Devin here, um, and 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 uh, and like uh, Victoria Jalise. Jalise Devin like, Devin wow, Walsh. That's a, yeah. that's a great cat. Minus just Johan. Just to watch him shred. <laughs> Johan, that's a great cat. Minus Johan. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. Here's a random one, kind of OG. Is do you go pants over the high back of the binding, or you go pants underneath? Is that is that like a is, is there because like, I know it's like I get I get a little finicky when some people do that too. Um, I used to be over, That's and then I'm I'm basically I let the high, high back show. It. That so was you like went a, over that, for a little bit, like early two thousands. Like over was it? That was, <laughs> yeah, that it's kind of like it's kind of a dying breed these days. It's kind of like the glove cuff over under too. Oh, true. And, huh? and, yeah. Are you over under on the cuff? Oh, uh, dude! I, I well, I'm I'm well, I, I go over, you know. Yeah, he's got to be technical, technically savvy <laughs> out there. Okay, um, worst trend. What do you got? I would say leashes in terms of what that was, and and uh, no, 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 you know, no, no stab at some of those guys that just rocked those leashes. To it that I just didn't get it, you know. If, and and if, if you, you know, and we got forced to wear them too. That was whack. <laughs> When they turn you, they turn you. Oh, you couldn't get on the lift without yeah, leaving. They yeah. wouldn't let you up. Yeah. Unless you yeah. had one, then you had to go buy one or go home or something, and that was whack. Great answers. We also ask uh, setups. What what snowboard? You can talk us through your whole head to toe because, um, you know, a lot of our listeners love the tech stuff. So what board you're riding, bindings, and then, you know, you can go through outerwear and everything else if you want to. You know, like uh, I have so many friends that do what they do, and I kind of switch like two years I do this into like, um, but I'd say my best experience and it's, it's no plug here is the, the black snowboard of death, Mr. Blue Montgomery. He does a great job and that whole crew. Um, I'm a directional camera guy, you know, um, I used to go all which, but I just kind of go straight and I, and I love like hitting it there. And I had this like, so I have my same stance is <laughs> the same stance. I'm goofy. It's, it's kind of zero fifteen twenty one and a half. you know, um, I never went outside that, you know, and it, I'm sorry. That's just me. Um, Vans. I, the, what the, High standard. Maybe. Yeah. I used to go with the, 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 the super stiff. And then I, I just kind of went soft now to with that stuff. So, uh, and, and then my union, um, Martino and those guys set me up. Um, and then like for, for, for gear here too, I, I, I like light stuff here too. Um, so I, I work with a new Gore-Tex Pro and it's like the body mapping here. So I want light and I want layered stuff, right? And and uh, yeah, man, that, that's what I do. I, I wear bibs and then and, and I wear that too. So it's, it's kind of like that. That's the thing. I, I, I'm kind of over the hoodie thing, you know? I don't I do not do rails. I'm sorry, you know? <laughs> so, and I, I just I just try to go deep, you know? Body mapping, what it just fits, it's made to tailor to your body? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just it, it's like, fits and fits right. performance you know like yeah and, and i want to layer that that's what it is i don't have to scream i mean i'm, I'm in a color now i'm with them like oh, i want to be dark but I, I brought some color i love i love color right now nice you know? yeah. yeah there's a time when everyone would want all black yeah yeah interesting uh when johan's 45 minute question that i had to cut down he also mentioned that when you go on uh, oh, cat geez. skiing trips that you bring like 50 kits with you. Oh, really? I guess he brings all kinds of different outfits. Outerwear and he, guy. He's wondering uh, like how long it takes for you to coordinate the amount of outerwear. You're I'm wearing. not one of those guys. That I, I get to look away. It's, it's literally crisis. like you have a short amount of time. You want to like try it and test it here too. It's, True. Not, it's not a fashion show. I just like, and I'm the first <laughs> one like, job. I'm the first one to like, dude, this shit doesn't work guys. Yeah. Get to this. I want I want to try it out. So. You know, whatever, dude. And you owe it to your customers if it doesn't work. R&D. You got to know. 
Let's do an R and D <laughs> with Johan and the cat. Uh, okay. Well, uh, last question we like to ask is, uh, what's next? What's next for Mike West? You know, uh, as much as my mind goes, what is and where is it going here, dude? I just want to. I want to live, guys. I want to live day to day, and I want to be a, a better dad to my kids. It's 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 a soft question here too, but I've been so there. I haven't been present a lot, and I want to. That's what's next is. I'm I'm sitting with you two freaking legends here doing what you love to do here, making it happen here. That, that I get psyched on that, you know what I'm saying? I want to I want to see this. I want I'm stoked on that, and that's all I'm here. I'm here today. I'm drinking some pub beer right here. I'll, can I open this thing? <laughs> yeah, here? Drink, is, 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 is that part of the thing? <laughs> you know, bomb all. This is this is today. This is on the be present. Appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for yeah, coming Mike on the West. show, Mike. We appreciate everything you do. Uh, it's been a really Huge pleasure for chatting with you. Uh, one last thing we also also do is thank yous. Do you, yes. you want to you throw any thank yous before we wrap this thing up? Uh, you know, just a uh, shout out to everyone that just gave us a chance. Every retailer, every athlete, you know, um, the people back in the warehouse, dude. It's like you guys can't remember. This is not me. I'm just privileged to be here. But it is so much of everyone that just doesn't get recognized. So I'm so psyched for them. Thank you. Sweet. Well, thank you again for coming on the show, Mike. We really appreciate it. It's been, it's been a fun masterclass in business. Uh, took the notebook out. A lot to learn. Got a lot to learn here. Um, and thank you so much to all of our listeners, everybody that tunes in every week and supports us. You guys kick ass. Uh, we will see you next week over and out from the bomb hole.